Hey everyone, how's it going? Welcome to Know Your Gear QA Live number 100, no, 208. <laughs> it says literally, oh, it says 108, but it's 208. Uh, so as always, if you're new to the show, if you want to ask us, us a question, uh, you're going to put a question mark first. And uh, if you're uh, watching the rebroadcast, we will take the time to timestamp all of the things that we discuss on this podcast. And I keep saying we, and it's because, because uh, you guys, uh, you guys asked for it. What'd you ask for? You asked for uh Nathan to come on the show. Hey Nathan, say hi. Hi. Let's oh, I'll do it my my hand this way. <laughs> hi. <laughs> and uh let let me uh so you guys know I make sure there's no issues with uh there's no latencies or if there's tell any problems with the audio or anything, let me know in the comments and we'll keep going. Um but uh, uh, Nathan's here physically. We're in the room. We're just uh, social distancing. He's on one side and I'm on the other side and just how we're, we're being safe, I guess. Yeah, we got to uh, be safe always. Yeah, got to be safe. And uh, so as you guys know, Nathan not only made this beautiful guitar that's behind me. In fact, I should probably, I should show you that. Let me, let me, <laughs> let, this guitar right here. This is the guitar that Nathan made for me. You guys may have seen that video. If you haven't, please watch that video. And uh, so basically, uh, Nathan worked at PRS for three years? Four years. Four years. Yeah, just over four years. Four years uh, doing top coat and uh, taking care of finishes. And now he works at the Fender Custom Shop for Jackson Charvel, right? Yep, Jackson Charvel and uh, EVH. And then every once in a while, I help out with like a Gretsch or a Fender or two. So here's the good news. Uh he can answer any of the questions you guys constantly <laughs> all ask me all the time about finishes. And I'm always like, I don't know. I asked Nathan. So Nathan's here. So if you got questions for, for Nathan about finishes on your guitars, this is a guy who literally has his hands on guitars that 75% of the people that watch this can't afford. You know what I mean? It's just true. It's just their expensive guitars. So yeah. obviously he's entrusted with some expensive finishes. Um, and then, uh, and uh, let's get started. I uh, saw some early questions. I always try to hit the early questions. Uh, the first question I see, I didn't capture them, so I apologize. But I think the first question is from uh, Bennett Karen. Uh, and it says, hey, Phil, love the show. I want a Les Paul bridge sound and the Strat neck sound. Okay. In the same guitar. How close yeah. can I get with the real deal? Could it be a challenge for a Somnium guitar? Um, well, the Somnium guitar will definitely do that because it's interchanging pickups. If you guys aren't familiar with what he's asking me about. He's asking about me the guitar. This is the Somni guitar that allows me to change out pickups um, and reverse them and flip them and do all kinds of weird stuff. But uh, you don't have to have a guitar like that to do that. Um, it's as simple as you could just stick a single coil <laughs> in the neck position of any guitar that has a humbucker. Um, to me, to me, uh, and, and, and Nathan, by the way, since you're here, interject anytime you want, whatever mm -hmm. I'm saying. But uh, what I was going to tell you was, to me, I don't think there's a Les Paul sound and a Strat sound as much as there is a humbucker sound and a single coil sound. Those, to me, are the more dominant sounds in my ears. I'm not saying Les Pauls and Strats don't have sounds, but realistically, you know what I mean? You, you really need a humbucker in the bridge, sounds like, and a single coil in the neck. And I think you're going to get most of the way there, especially if you get kind of the right kind of pickups. Yeah, and he didn't say like that position four of a strat thing where you get the neck in the middle of uh you know, we've got the single coils from that. But to right. me that's my favorite part of a strat. So like a good hum single single setup I think would be great and what he's looking for. You get like some fifty seven classics or something for that that bridge that bridge pickup, I think it'd be be set. Yeah. So that was a uh, th thank you for the question, man. That was pretty cool. And you know what it is? That's my favorite. What you're describing is what I love. Uh, I love a single coil neck pickup and a humbucker bridge. Literally, that's like 90% of the time I'm playing. That's the sound I'm going for. So, uh, and, and you can do it to any guitar. I've done it to most of mine already. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, there you go. And I will either do that or I'll just have a humbucker in the neck that I can coil split, or. I roll the vo I personally, if I don't coil split, which is not all the time, I like to just roll my volume back on the neck pickup. It'll thin down, especially if you have a nice, like, sweet, low output kind of PAF style pickup. You roll that volume on mo on on your guitar about a quarter way back, and it really thins out. And it can I can to me I can make it sound like a strat to the to the audience, so to speak. And that's good enough for me. Like Ernie Ball has that 
Valentine. They doesn't that have like a fake humbucker, like that single that slanted single coil that's the humbucker shape? Do they make that pickup separately? Can you just buy that? Which pickup is it? Remember the the Ernie Ball Valent? Is it James Valentine oh, yeah, yeah. from Muse? It's got that like slanted single coil, but it's in a humbucker size. I if they sell that pickup, maybe you could just take one of those and throw that in the neck position. Ab- absolutely, I don't know. If of they like sell a two humbucker that. guitar, yeah. Um, let's see what else we have. More comments. Our one more questions. Early comer questions. Um, Edgar's question is: Thank you, Phil, for all the knowledge and expertise. I bought a Gibson Les Paul sixty standard from Sam Ash Guitars of Distinction. What <laughs> is your knowledge about the guitars of distinction that Sam Ash offers? I know nothing about it. Somebody mentioned it a couple weeks ago, or maybe a couple months ago. Guitars of Distinction. I remember googling it, and it was it's it's like um. Nathan, do you know what Guitar Center calls it? They have like the platinum or something. Yeah, like the that. platinum. Like everybody, I think has this now, right? So yeah. I, th- I think this is what this is. I'm just guessing. Guitars of Sti- distinction is like, you know, probably they give you extra attention, more extra pictures, more love. I'm thinking right? mm-hmm. <laughs> more of a. Hopefully, that's kind of what I'm getting from it, right? and it's their high end guitars. Um, uh, I'll tell you what, just like I got Nathan on the show, I can get Sammy Ash on the show. And if you want to ask him personally, I'll have him explain the whole thing to you. Um, <laughs> Let's just, you know, get yeah. some name drops in here yeah. real quick. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, so, you know, it's not just that. It's just he he, he and I have talked about him coming on the show many times, too. And uh, so you guys know, uh, Sam Sammy Ash is not only uh, told me personally many times over the last year that he'd like to come on the podcast, but... He, he, he wants to come on as one of us, as a guitar lover. He's like, look, I'm not here to hawk my store. You know, he's, his stores are fine. They've been around for a long time. They're doing well. He's, he wants to come on just to, he, in other words, he actually asked that if he could come on the show and just be one of us. You know what I mean? Just nerd uh, out. Yeah, you know, Nathan uh, probably has some insight on this too. When you work in the guitar business, it's great that you get to mingle your, your livelihood and your passion. Yes, but sometimes, because it's your livelihood, you kind of sometimes want to turn that part off for a minute. Yeah, and just enjoy the, the part that I enjoy. You know what I mean? Like yeah. Like, the, the nerd part of it. Like, sure, I work on guitars all day, but you know what else I love? Pedals. Like, I'm a big pedal guy, and I'll talk about pedals, you know, all day. And still, just being able to talk about guitars is just fine. I'm not the kind of guy that gets burnt out after, you know, 10 hours of working on guitars a day. Going home, I still just go home and end up going on Craigslist for a couple hours looking at more guitars anyway. <laughs> I know that's 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 how you know we're all sick. We're literally like to the point where like, oh, when you're not looking, when you're not working on guitars, you're looking at guitars. Yeah, because that's exactly what it is. Okay, um, and I think there's one more early question I want to hit, and that was from David, who says, uh, "What are your thoughts on the Epiphone line?" And the, I don't know what that is. Navin Terry's. What is that? I don't know what Navin something series. I think it's series. The words got put together. Is there? Do you know what he's talking about? I can't. Yeah. Is it? Is it a super chat? Because I didn't. It's see not. The it's the yeah, one of the first comments. Um, I don't know anything about it. How about that? I know the words. Are, I know it says something series, so I don't know what it's saying. Um, and I'm sure we could look, but it wouldn't matter anyways. I know nothing about any Epiphones. I literally have, and I think I've I've said this. I other than a couple Epiphones that came in for setup and repair, which are usually older ones, I haven't seen any new Epiphones. Uh, at all i have an epiphone muse in box that i haven't opened yet that's for review that i bought to review because the patrons wanted me to review an epiphone and so that's the one i bought because um you guys know i like my gibson les paul light and uh it's apparently the same specifications or close to the specifications but i have no i mean literally i have no no experience with any of the new epiphone stuff and um uh, I don't think Epiphone's ever going to send anything out. So it's going to have to, to get Epiphone's on the channel, it has to be through the patron where they're recommending them and then I purchase them like we've been doing. And right now we have one and that's the only one I plan to review for the entire year. Unless, of course, you know, I, I get more requests. <laughs> if we get requests, like I said, regardless of if companies send guitars to the channel or not, if you guys request it, if I get enough requests, there's enough interest, we buy it, I literally review it and then we sell it. So there's just no way I won't say, oh, okay, thank you. By the way, Al says Fender Noventa. Uh, I think that's what he, I don't know. I'm sidetracked. Sometimes I got to, like I said, stop reading the screen when I'm talking. Those but, Epiphone uh, prophecies, the new ones that they did with like Fishman's and stuff in it. A lot of people have been talking about those. Yeah. Those look really cool. Cause I remember the old, old 
prophecies when they were when they were at Guitar Center, and I really wanted one of the red uh, Les Paul custom ones. This is this is so so just to make things easy for everyone. Here's what I'll do a double plug for you. Uh, I'll put a link to and when I do the timestamp, I would definitely check out Agufish his channel for Epiphones. Agufish is on it, man. He's he's got all the new Epiphones. Um, and uh, so that's who I recommend. In fact, if I was curious about an phone right now, that's probably who I'd channel I'd go to and go check him out because I know he's reviewed a lot of them. I see it on his uh, Instagram and stuff when he's posting and stuff. So that's where I go. But like I said, the Epiphone guys have uh, talked to me in the past about sending some guitars out. It always falls through. And so <laughs> I've just kind of stopped. <laughs> I'm just done. You know what I mean? Uh, I have 19 guitars uh, for review right now. Jeez. And yeah, and it's so, I mean, it's, uh, I'm, I'm very happy to be busy. But it's hard when you you know suck up a few hours talking to companies and nothing happens. Um, so uh, like I said, if you guys want Epiphones on the channel, just keep requesting them and then I'll just purchase them. Uh, what else? Okay, probably get some, some super chats. Actually, I want to wait. Hold on to the super chats. Um, Cheddar was saying that uh, Lawrence should make a signature Nathan envelope filter pedal <laughs> in the comments. <laughs> See, you should. Right? Yeah, because I don't have enough envelope filters already since I got my 14th one this week. Okay, so let uh, let me... Let, you know what? Actually, let me go into the... To, this is kind of nice. I have, I hope this is going to feel like a good show because this is a cooler pace. N usually I'm more frantic. Yeah, somebody I'm, asked earlier about putting whiteout on nitro. I think that might have been a super chat, so you probably end up sure. getting into let's, it. Sure, let's look. Well, actually, go, I'm pulling that up right as we speak. Um the new cameras and stuff for today to set up for Nathan and get all this set up to be uh, for the show. Uh, it's, it was, uh, hold on, where do I go? Okay. Uh, it made me to where I, I didn't think about every screen I possibly need. Somebody said, Nathan, do you hate, uh, do you hate relic guitars? And I'm going to say no, because if I accidentally drop one, then it doesn't matter. <laughs> so it's like we could still sell it because they'll just relic it out. But as far as just relic in general, like I know e like ESP LTD, sometimes those those relics that are like a wrap where it's like a decal wrap and it looks relic. That's a little weird to me. Wait, what's a decal wrap? A relic? Remember uh, LTD like a while back? I don't think they still oh. do it. Remember they had like strats that were relic and it wasn't even like a relic. It was like a yeah, it was... almost like a decal or something around well, the whole guitar. I, I think, okay, you could be right. But if I remember, what I remember about those was, I think it was, they stenciled the, the relicking and then they clear coated over it. They were like satin. Like, yeah, they were so satin. I'm not, but maybe they might have been decals. You might have been right. Yeah, it felt like a decal to me. They, so that was interesting. That was, I don't, I don't hate relic guitars to answer that <laughs> question. I, I asked, uh, I asked Ron Thorne when we were doing that video, uh, what's easier to make, uh, uh, relic guitars or like custom finished guitars. And he said, well, both are pretty difficult. He says, but uh, he likes, or he says it's it's funner to do relic guitars because of what you said. He doesn't yeah, have yeah. to worry about, he doesn't have to worry about scratching or messing up the guitar. Yeah, you still want to get all like, your sanding scratches out. But like for us, the relic guitars go to uh, the Fender custom shop side just because those guys relic guitars all day. So even the stuff that's like EVH or, well, not EVH, I haven't done any of those, but any like Charvel or Jackson that needs to get relic I, we do our thing and then it goes to them so they can relic up the body and then it comes back to us. And those are nitro because nitros are, or nitro is easier to, to relic. Oh, wow. Mm. Um, okay. Some, somebody asked oh. if I work with John Cruz. No, I'd started after, after he left. Oh yeah. The, um, uh, I heard he's starting it up on his new, a new guitar company. I had also heard that. Uh, yeah. but I'm not sure. Right. Like I said, since he was gone before I even moved back to California, I don't really know much about that. It's kind of just rumor mill stuff. Yeah, yeah, but I, I like I said I heard it too. I heard that he's starting up a company, uh, like officially. Like I think I, I don't think I heard it like a rumor. I think I got an email notification from somebody. Oh, there you go. Um, uh, saying he's doing the guitars uh, for some store. A store? Yeah. Uh, like, well, you gotta understand. Like Wildwood Guitars, I think they have a luthier that builds guitars. I mean, yeah, there, a lot of these high end stores have like a luthier that builds guitars. So it could be that's, like Pitbull or yeah, that's Wild what, West Guitar, or something like that in California. I got the vibe. It's something like that. So, Greg, uh, next question comes from Greg. Greg says, uh, hey, Phil, the Spark Amp hum is the power supply issue. So he's got a hum in his Spark Amp, and he's saying, it's, is it the power supply? He's asking. He says it happens on, his, on all his guitars. So 
I don't know this for sure. So again, I, but I, I think it's what I understand is you can contact um, them if you're having the hum, if you got one of the original uh, non-grounded plugs and they'll send you a new plug, I think. I'm sure there's a ton of people now that have, have dealt with this and they can speak about it. Um, here's what I can tell you about my Spark and I've talked about this in podcasts before. I do have one of the first editions that do not have a ground plug. I have no humming issues when it comes to the plug. The only issues I've had with my Spark since I've owned it, or because I still play it every day, uh, the only issues I've ever had with it is when I use high gain distortion pedals, only that, no, not just overdrives, no other effects. Whenever I plug a high gain pedal into it, it does get a hum. Not the not the humming of the fizz of the distortion, just literally like it hums. And so I took uh, you know audio of it, I took some stuff and I sent it to Spark months and months and months ago, right after I reviewed it. And they said they would look into it and and try to recreate the problem and look into it. But I don't really have a whole lot of reason to run a high gain pedal into that amp. I only discovered that problem because I was working on demo ideas for it. Um, but since I haven't had any problems, um, but if you are having a hum issue, I've seen where tons of people have shown, there's crazy videos I watch where guys are like, oh, first you plug it in, then you run it out to another amp and do all this I think you just need the plug. Just get the <laughs> plug. <laughs> um, I think that, I think uh, I'm very sure that Spark had, or the, uh, those guys had uh, positive grid had fixed the issue and I saw announcements. And uh, if not, uh, let me know. I'll, I'll, I'll reach out to those guys. So they asked me to do another video, uh, uh, like a year in the life with my spark and, uh, it keeps kind of falling through, but I want to do it. So I'll do it whether, regardless if we can figure it out with spark or not. Um, the, the next one comes from the station. I don't know what this is. <laughs> ST three something. Hey, Phil, uh, thanks for great channel. Uh, what are your thoughts on the Lawler Eldorado pickups? Any other coil split pickups that nail humbucker and uh, single coil tones? Uh, lots of them do, <laughs> right? I like the PRS pickups for that. I like Lawler. I mean, here, here's here's the thing. Uh, Nathan, you ever played any Lawler pickups? Um, I think I've played a set of P90s from them, but not any humbuckers. And the, Oh, and then Lawler pickups. Oh, no, wait. There was a Fralin that were in the old uh, EGs from PRS. Never mind. <laughs> yeah, I, I've never played a bad Lawler pickup. I've not played all of them, but I haven't played a bad one. I like them all. For a good split coil tone, I love the bare knuckle mule, which is like his kind of PAF style uh, yes. pickup. And I have one in my Tremonti with a P90 neck pickup. And when I split that, so you've got the P90 neck and the single coil uh, for the bridge, that in between tones, really, really awesome. So my, my vote goes to the bare knuckle mule. That's a good one, too. Another one I like for uh, humbucker split coil is the uh, Fortitude by DiMaggio. Uh, that's one of my favorite pickups. I actually have it like three different guitars. Um, <laughs> that's a great pickup. Uh, especially since the guy who, you know, did it is like, you know, Gojira, it, Gojira is like a heavy distortion guy. But I love that pickup for everything from super clean, you know, stratty, bluesy rock to the death metal. It's all, it's great. Although they're not death metal, but the <laughs> idea. Okay. Um, let's see. I want to try to grab some questions that are for specifically for Nathan. Did you see anybody? Um, there was that Nitro question earlier where okay. somebody asked about putting white out on Nitro. Okay. And Because he asked if it would react to the Nitro. And Nitro will react to any type of liquid that touches it pretty much, except for maybe water. But he was specifically asking about doing it on the neck so he could just do side dots. Because I said he said his side dots are pretty dark. So if you're just like putting a dot, like yeah, it'll probably ruin the finish. But you know, if you're just putting a tiny little dot, I wouldn't say it's really that big of a deal. So if yes, it'll be harmful to the finish. But if you're really just trying to give yourself an easier thing to look at while you're playing, I'd say like I'd say go ahead and do it and not worry about the resale value or anything. Uh, LPD says Nate needs a pop filter. So, all right, he'll back off the mic there, you Lawrence. Yeah, we were talking about that earlier. We were talking about it earlier. Floop de doo um, says, Nathan, does Paul Reed Smith keep human heads in jars? And all I can say is I can't comment on what he keeps in jars. <laughs> and Floop de doo you'll have to comment. Is that from? Is that a Patton Oswalt reference? Because every time I see your name, I think of a Patton Oswalt stand-up set. So, look at look, it's a live show, and I'm asking pe other yeah. people questions. <laughs> <laughs> The um, 
The interesting, I, I have a question f- for whoever asked that question. Why would you put white out on a guitar? I guess just, like I said, the side dots, so you can see them a little bit oh. better. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was saying, okay, don't worry. Okay, I, I missed that, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah he yeah. said side dots, so I think it wouldn't really be a big deal if you just, you know, just a little dot of white out on the side, It'd probably be fine. I mean, you'd have to end up sanding it off, I'm sure, but it's your guitar, and you need to see while you're playing, so I'd say go ahead and go for it. ST says nitro smells like vanilla, is that correct? I think so, yeah. Plus a lot, well, and a lot of companies that use nitro give you expensive cases, and those expensive cases always smell sweet too. Yes. So it's a little bit of both. Yeah. Like the glue inside of the, those cases will smell like that as well. So I I definitely notice it's the cases, but sometimes when I talk about nitro smelling like sweet, mm-hmm. everybody goes, no, it's just the case. The nitro itself doesn't smell sweet, but I always thought nitro smells sweet. It's both, yeah. The... Um, and then, like you, I said, guys, if you have questions about finish, this would be the time to ask them for sure. I'll get to all the other ones. but, uh, And then real quick, on a side note, just because it's to Mitchell. Mitchell says, Phil, have you sent out the treble bleed? I don't know. I, I kind of, when I do these giveaway things, I kind of give that stuff. I forward it to my wife, and it goes out when, it, when she gets out to it. It depends on, here's what I've learned. It depends on if it's going in the mail or if it's going UPS. If it goes UPS, she's fast. She gets it out that day. But you can imagine if it has to go out to the mail, she has to go to the post office. And she tries to do that, I think, once a week. So, um, But if you haven't, ha- haven't got it yet, you'll you'll get it soon enough. She's pretty diligent about getting that stuff out. Okay. Um, Somebody said use glow-in-the-dark paint instead of white out. That's a pretty good idea. And it, But you said, will it react to the nitro? The Yeah, the glow-in-the-dark paint would still react to the nitro. But... I'm just saying, yeah, somebody suggested that as an alternative. So is there anything they can put as dots on the nitro? Stickers. Stickers won't affect them as much. So, like, it'll still affect it a little bit, but that your safest option would probably just be stickers on, on the sides. Nice. So there you go. Interesting. Um, which is interesting you say that because that would be the opposite of what I would think. <laughs> okay, so if Flip Doo answered, it was from... It was from the movie Role Models. Now I remember. Hmm. Um, but somebody asked if I was going to talk about the refinish process on your guitar. I think you pretty much said everything to, there was to do in that video, unless anybody has a specific question about it. On the finish on my guitar, it's not nitro, right? No, no. That's yeah. uh, well, the satin nitro neck, and then that's two uh, um, K acrylic for the, it's polyester base coat, and then a two K acrylic top coat. Um. I have, so. I have a question for you from Nikos. Nico says, hey, Nathan, if I want to refinish my Mexi Strat with nitro so I can relic it easier, do I need to remove all the finish till I get to the wood? Yeah, you're going to if you want to if you want to relic it, I'd say yes. If you're just going to be doing nitro and put it on top, it probably, you know, you just scuff up the body and put the nitro on top and it would probably be fine. But if specifically, if you want to relic it, the hard part of relicking, like, Sorry, not the hard part, but relic. But nitro is easy to relic. So as you're burning through the nitro, then you would just get to the polyester top coat of the finish that's already there, and then then you're gonna have a hard time relicking that. So unless your goal is to just have that color show through, you know what I mean? So that way it looks like a refinish that's just kind of worn through. Then yeah, you can do it. He can do it the way that he's talking about. But if you just want a straight up relic and like down to bare wood. I'd probably say just strip the whole thing and then do nitro and then relic it would be my suggestion. And then uh, Sira says, hey, Nathan, are paper towels the best polishing cloths? A guitar tech in Austin says yes. Are paper towels? The, uh, no. I mean, if you're just buying a paper towel like at the grocery store or something, I would probably not polish with just a paper towel. Um, what we have at work is we use shop rags and then we have this like it's like a shop paper towel and that like it's so it's not just like is it that you know, blue paper towel stuff uh ours are not blue no they're oh. white um but i know exactly what you're talking about like like what uh, garages and yeah. mechanics have and stuff yeah that's it's probably about the same material so that's that's not too far off because those are designed to not scratch stuff whereas if you just like buy a you know bounty or something like that from the grocery store it's probably not going to work out as well it's definitely going to scratch finish. Even, like fresh finish that hasn't been scratched at all scratches a lot people a lot easier than people think. Just having, you know, surface scratches and stuff. Okay, I have two questions for you. Uh, one is from 
Ken, I'm going to say Ken, <laughs> says Nathan, I'm an original owner of an Ernie Ball Music Man F1 that is intended to be a time capsule piece. This guitar has lived sealed in the case, but the finish is delaminating. Any advice to, to mitigate this? To mitigate it? Like to keep it from happening? Yeah. Or to, yeah, to stop fix it? it? No. He, he says... Uh, I mean, that, how, that sounds like an adhesion issue to me. It's like maybe they didn't scuff it up in between coats correctly maybe uh one of them was like if you go in between coats and if you spray a guitar scuff it up and then wait too long especially with color like if you spray a guitar you spray the color on black and then you wait too long in between to do the coat of clear on top then that black isn't tacky anymore and so it'll it'll delaminate or lift um, without seeing the guitar in front of me, like I can fix finish lift, you know, with, with glue and stuff like that, but without super glue, right? Yeah. Yeah. You can use, uh, <laughs> si how do you print cyan, cyan, cyanolite glue? I can't remember exactly how to pronounce it, but it's glue that will react to an accelerator. Um, I'll usually use that to, to fix any kind of finish lift issues. But as far as keeping it from happening, I mean, that's a warranty issue. Like if it's lifting and you're not even playing the guitar. That should be covered under a lifetime warranty because that's a factory defect, I think. But I don't know what Ernie Ball's warranty is or anything. So your first bet is to contact them because I don't know what kind of finish they're using either. So to basics, to I can, yeah, my, my best suggestion would be to call about a warranty issue first. And if not, then to keep it from happening, it'd be just, you know, make sure it's humidified correctly and it's not getting fluctuated temperature. Like you can say it's a time capsule, but if you keep it in your garage in Arizona, that's gonna that temperatures are gonna really really fluctuate and you'll have issues right. there with the guitar heating up and and cooling down. Right. So, yeah, keep it humidified or in a um, climate controlled area and call about a warranty for sure on that one. Especially if you're not playing it, you know what I mean. You're not putting wear and tear on that guitar. Uh, Lawrence has a question for you, and then I'll do a question next. It says uh, uh, he wants to know what's your favorite or best brand and type of filler for mahogany and trans for translucent finishes. So I haven't done much filling and stuff like that, like doing, doing grain fill because that's like a base coat thing or what, or undercoat. Uh, but it really depends. Cause like if you're doing a red, if you're doing like a trans red, then you'd want to get like a really dark grain filler to really, really make it pop out. Um, if you're doing like what, uh, what, fill your mirror is that grain filler is pretty dark you know on the on the natural to make all of the grain kind of pop out right so definitely if you're doing a trans finish the darker the grain fill the better because you're going to be able to see all the see all the rings and and stuff like that huh. um the next question comes from george it says hey phil building a telly with a humbucker in the neck and it goes half volume in second position uh using using the obsidian kit any thoughts sounds to me uh like the pickups are out of phase with each other that they the volume issue seems to be from when you're connecting the two pickups together um the best fast easy way to test this is to switch the ground and the hot on one of those pickups and just flop it <laughs> you know flip flop it so basically uh you know you can imagine whatever they're connected to now whatever your ground is on one just pick one of the pickups i'd probably pick the neck whatever the ground is connected to and whatever the hot is connected to swap that put the hot on the ground and the ground on the hot and then try it again and see if that fixes the problem that should fix the problem although sometimes i don't really attribute what you're saying that problem to volume drop it's more of a nasal kind of thing is what it's going to sound like but yeah. everybody perceives sound differently and you might be perceiving what I call nasal as a volume drop because there is a little bit of drop to it as well. Um, I mean, that's 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 a that's the fast fix that I hope will fix it. And I'd start there. Uh, Daniel says, Phil, thoughts on Fender wide range comfy pick a reissue. This question keeps coming up <laughs> all the time. Uh, better than El Nico. Uh, one came in the neck of my American original 70s Tele custom. I like it. Thanks. I, I like those pickups. Um, I think a lot of players like those pickups. Um, you know, to me, I would never put them in the same category as the Klon, <laughs> but they're definitely in this category of the mystique pickup of, you know, 
mystery, right? And it's a great pickup, and I could see why someone would be drawn to it. I like them, but I'm not. It's not so different from any other type of pickup like that that I'm just like, there's just no way. There are things I like about it, the size, uh, you know, I like the tone of it. Um, but uh, let me put it this way: I've never felt, I've never felt in any kind of want to like put those in any other guitars besides what they come in already. And then, uh, oh, okay. And then, by the way, LV was the one who asked you, and he did super chat. He asked about the the whiteout on the finish. Okay, I knew I wasn't crazy. I knew I saw it. <laughs> Thomas wants uh, me to have a pint on him, and uh, and uh, thank you, Thomas, because that was ten dollars, and with inflation, that's what a pint costs now. <laughs> I think I got a pint last week, and it was like literally eight, ten dollars, and I was like, whoa, woo! All right, uh, so I'm not used to I'm not used to the prices coming up so fast. Um, and then I have no idea how to say this. I'm going to say Ill Freeman. Ill Freeman. Ill Freeman 1. He's the first one, not anymore after him. Says, hey, Phil, I bought my first two guitars. Uh, Yamaha Pacifica and a Maneric. Uh, uh, Monaric, remember? Monaric. Is it Monaric or Maneric? Yeah. Monaric. Oh, yeah, we did we the How Do You Save video. How Do You Save video, yep. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> Nathan was the the poor, the poor, poor guy who... Help me shove the camera on. Ask yeah, everybody carrying everything. It well, was my idea to do Monaric too. Yeah, and and uh, he knows the pain of that video. If you guys know that, I we did a video at the NAM where we asked every company how to, how to pronounce their name. I love the video. I've never done another one since <laughs> because the fact that he could tell you it took didn't it take us like three days. Yeah, it was insane. And it took borrowing a cable from Big Joe. Remember yeah. Big Joe pedals it, lent it, us a cable for the battery. It was yeah because we were <laughs> the batteries were going dead on the, because. Yeah. We sat, I don't want to get sidetracked, but it was just so strange. A thing you will never predict when you do content and stuff. It never occurred to me when I said, hey, wouldn't it be fun? I told Nathan, hey, wouldn't it be fun if we asked companies, how do you say Rickenbacker? You know, right? Instead of yeah. Rickenbacker, it's Rickenbacker. And uh, how do you say, you know, these names? And uh, here's what the hell of it was. Every company were like, hey, we want to do a video where you just say, how do you pronounce your name? We got like two, maybe three companies went, what? Amazing. Let's do it. Yeah. The rest were like, what? Zemitis did not want it. We had to convince Zemitis yeah. to do it. We had, we had, yeah. I, I think they were the one where I, they said no. And then I go, fine, I'll just make it up on my own. Yeah. And then that, when we recorded it, that one other guy that was working as Zemitis walked by and pronounced it completely different. Remember he kind of yelled over? Yeah, Zemitis. That was funny. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, um, the um the worst one uh just so you know the worst one was um takamini because the president of takamini his english was so bad you know that he didn't understand what we we're saying over and over again and so what happened was all we needed in the clip was this is i said hey this is how you know whatever i'd say my name i'd be like this is phil mcknight and this is how you say and then i just hang the mic over and they just had to say their name and remember every time i hand the mic to him he go and this guitar has bridge. Yeah, he was going like a. <laughs> and he would just start pitch. demoing guitar stuff to us. And I go, no, 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 no. You just say Takamini. Mm -hmm. And he's like, okay. And I go, okay. This is Phil, and this is how you say. And he's like, and new new models coming out this year. <laughs> yeah. Right? Like you could tell, and it, I didn't understand at the moment, but I understand now. I think what happened was he rehearsed, like everything he needed to say to yeah, like a whole to, spiel. Yeah, a spiel yeah. to potential buyers and stuff. And then he just didn't understand what we're saying, which, so it, that took like two hours <laughs> to get that clip. It, I'm not exaggerating. That was a long time. Um, so yeah, it was a cool video. Uh, so back to uh, <laughs> the Menarch. His first two guitars. Uh, yeah. So the, so he's got a Yamaha and a Menarch Lotus uh, during COVID. Okay. He says, now I have no idea who to trust to get them set up. Uh, how do I choose? How do you choose? Um well, you'd use references. That's the same way you use. I wish there was like an Angie's list for repair guys. We really need that. Um, I I've uh, I know Angie's list has been purchased by another company. I don't know the other one. So they they have two names. I have uh, I have now had two major projects in my home done by Angie's list, where I went on there. And it was an amazing experience, <laughs> right? I like went on there and I literally used an app and within like hours, somebody came to my house, bid the job out, right? And then I picked three bids. You know, if there's three bids, I picked one and they built it. And um, and it's kind of like uh, an Uber 
kind of thing where there's, <laughs> I give them feedback, they give me feedback, and then, you know, we move on our way and I can look. So when they say, hey, this is the person who's going to put the drywall in my house or do something, I can go, oh, okay, here's 20 other people who have given him feedback, you know, this particular company on this project. I wish there was something like that for Guitar Techs. Maybe we need something like that. It would be for sure. Um, because there's definitely more bad techs than good ones. Um, and the reason is, is because everyone kind of just says, okay, I'm a tech today. And uh, my best... So here's why I'm telling you this. I understand your frustration with trying to find one. You got to use references. You, you know, you got to use the people around you, you know, find people, reach out, go on your Facebook. You know what I mean? Find out, you know, who's in your area and who does a good job. And then here's another wacky thing that you have to do with guitar techs specifically. You have to find out who's good right now. Because when you find somebody and they say, oh, I go to this person, I went two years ago and they're great. It's another thing, like there's ebb and flows of when techs are good or bad, right? Uh, there's a, that's my experience with it. I'm just telling you my experience where there's sometimes, uh, there's a famous, in my area, there's a famous guitar tech uh, <laughs> who's notoriously known for doing the absolute best and the absolute worst work. Um, <laughs> and I knew La Nathan's laughing because if you live in Phoenix, everyone that lives in Phoenix knows exactly who I'm talking about. This person literally does the best and the worst work. And it really is, and I'm not exaggerating, this is true, dependent on how much he likes you. And I learned that over the years doing repairs in the Valley. When I started doing repairs in Phoenix in, in 2005, uh, that's what I was told. He was the best. And then slowly over time, you would hear all these horrible stories. Customers would come in where he'd done horrible things to their guitars. And you would look at this and you're like, this doesn't make sense. Like, And I would think the customers were were lying because I'm like, why would he do this? He's He's got a great reputation. Over time, that's what I learned. I learned he's does good work or bad work and it depends on whether or not he likes you. So that's why I said you have to kind of, you have to kind of put fillers out there for your, for your techs and for who's doing good work at the time. Um, that's one suggestion for you. And uh, the other thing I suggest is, um, is uh, try to find somebody who gives you information about the setup that they do. Though one of the things, uh, you know, I do, is I fill out paperwork. Uh, so if if you if I do work on your guitar, I at least write down all the stuff I did. Um, my my thing that I never liked about guitar repair is those stupid carbon carpet sheets that are like set up fifty bucks and it's like done, <laughs> and then they hand it to you and you didn't know what they did. I I put the measurements of where you know where where I left it. I put you know, what I addressed, what I did. I try to put information, I have a checklist, uh, to, to keep me, uh, keep me on track, you know, to make sure I test all those things. So those are all things I would suggest you do. <laughs> yeah. Giving helps. you a carbon copy receipt, I think is at least a little bit better than somebody who just like, yeah, pay me cash. And then here's your guitar back. Yeah. Like, gets... Cause at least like you've got a paper trail and they've got their name on something that you have to be able to say like, yeah, this is how I know that this guy was not doing good work is cause he gave me his receipt and I can say, like, definitively, I paid this guy to do some work. You know what I mean? And, yes. But so I generally think that people that do have receipts tend to at least care a little bit more and treat it more like a business. Yeah. Well, that's – and you know what? Perfectly. I'm glad uh, Nathan's here for that. That's a perfectly said thing. You want somebody who's who feels like a business, who's treating you like a customer. Um, you know, it's part of the worst – The part of the thing that I hate about what I do <laughs> – which is repair guitars is there are so many, like I said, bad repair guys. And so, you know, when I mean bad, also keep in mind, I mean, attitude, they're horrible. They're the, some of them are just horrible. I don't know what it is about the personality. Um, the, um, when I worked in, <laughs> when I worked in, uh, in my corporate life, I had always seen on Saturn Live and all these uh, these shows where they made fun of IT guys about how horrible IT guys are. <laughs> and in my corporate experience, my IT guys were great. <laughs> yeah, they, they sighed at you a little bit, you know what I mean, when you asked them like something and they knew they got to say like turn off your computer or something basic. But I've never had experiences like I've had with guitar repair guys where you go in and you, you just get, you know, berated. <laughs> <laughs> right they you know um yeah it's like there's a local store here and they seem to treat you better like if you're a gigging musician and yeah. it's like you get this attitude of like just because i'm a hobbyist like 
they treat you worse. And it's like, I'm not allowed to just enjoy this thing that I want you to fix. Like I have to be a professional at it in order to get good service. That's really weird and backwards to me. And so I've noticed that with tech sometimes, if you can't talk about how you played a live show last week, then they just kind of pass you off as like a, a hobbyist and don't want to do as good work for you. It's like, Oh, they're just a hobbyist. They don't know any better. My, and, uh, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, you good. Sorry. My uh, my first experience with a guitar tech. In fact, that's what started my journey. Why I wanted to to repair guitars. I wanted to repair guitars because I like people, in that interaction that you have where somebody gives you a problem, which is a challenge, which is fun, something for you to deal with. You solve it, and then you explain. You know, you give it back to them. You explain what you did, and you have this interaction. It's to me, it's a very fun experience. Um, the 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 desire to do that came from. Uh, I'll never say who, because <laughs> again, I'm not here to smack talk anybody, but I'm going to tell you my first experience with a repair guy ever in my life was this. I, uh, I got my dream guitar. Uh, this is a hundred, uh, this is just, just the sign of the times, you know, before YouTube, before there was videos, before I knew what the hell any, anything was. I got my dream guitar at the time, which was an Ibanez RG770. That was like the thing to have for me. Um, I had no, I didn't, I didn't play shred music. I didn't know what to do with it. I just wanted it. <laughs> right. Uh, I got, it. it was laser blue and I didn't know how to do the bridge or anything. And, um, this guitar was expensive and it was a big deal to me because it was a big deal for my mom to buy this guitar. This was my graduation present from high school to give you a concept. Okay. This is literally what I got. You know what I mean? In fact, it's in my high school yearbook. Like my, I took a picture with it. That's how lame this was. That's how, well, I guess I decided I was about the guitar, but how lame I was. So it was a big deal. That guitar then was $700, uh, which was the deal my mom negotiated in the music store. So again, I want, I want to give you the weight of this. Uh, this was a strict guitar. It was a big deal. My mom was, you know, in shock that I wanted this thing that was so expensive. And <laughs> I don't know why, but I, I don't know how I did it. I don't know how the stars aligned, but I got it. I took it to a guitar tech and I handed it to him saying, hey, I'm having trouble with the guitar staying in tune, you know, with the bridge because I didn't know how to use the Floyd. And I handed it to him and he's like, oh, here's your problem. You bought an Ibanez hat. It's a piece of shit. And that's your problem. <laughs> and, you know, I just graduated high school, so I'm still stupid, of course. And I left it with him. So he had it for a month. And then when Jeez. I got it back, I paid him $45 and I'm sure I think he tuned it. <laughs> <laughs> um, that stuck with me. You know what I mean? To the point now where when I see that, I, it really upsets me. Your guitar is your guitar. It's special to you and no one should insult it. And I know we're going on a tangent about this, but it's because I, Freeman, I know you're, what you're saying. You're new. You got two guitars. You want to know who to trust. I'm telling you, first start with someone who actually looks like they give a crap. <laughs> then try to get some references to show that they do good work. And I think that's, I think it's a safe bet. And it, uh, and, I, and I appreciate you indulging my tangent on this. The, uh, Nathan, do you? Uh, <laughs> somebody's got a follow up. Oh. Guitar Center's tech dropped a screwdriver on my PRS and took a huge chunk out. Didn't even apologize or discount on the job. What can I do? Dang. So that here's stinks. the problem with Speaking that. Of bad text. This is a, this is a, this is an issue. So first of all, I don't want to give you any bad advice. Of course, you know, right. This is a, a I take all this stuff we talk about seriously. So I want to tell you something I've experienced already with Guitar Center and the techs. And I want to also start with two important things that are important for me to say. One, one of my good friends is a tech at a Guitar Center. He graduated from Roberto Venn. He now techs at Guitar Center. They pay him crap. He's miserable. In fact, he's a really good tech. Um, however, he works uh, He works there, you know, honing his skills, Okay. And it's guaranteed work. You don't have to find. Yeah, and it's guaranteed work. And 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 my best advice, which he's uh, he's taking very seriously, is I said, look, man, do do a great job and get the hell out of there. It's not because they're anything about Guitar Center; they just don't pay those techs very well. The uh, the problem is, uh, I've heard these stories already with Guitar Center. Um, the first time I ever heard a story where guitar tech at Guitar Center damaged a guitar, I, my advice, which apparently was very wrong, was to go to Guitar Center and talk to the manager. And apparently in that circumstance, and things could change, but that circumstance, what happened with that customer was they went to Guitar Center and the Guitar Center manager explained that the guitar repair is separate and different than Guitar Center, which is insane, by the way. Yeah, it's like 
three businesses under one roof because of like the lessons too. Yeah. Like, now, so you know, I, and Nathan, you know, Nathan worked for me and he worked with me, so he knows exactly how this works. My repair business was a a a LLC. My guitar store was an LLC, and my lesson academy was an LLC. But never did I have the balls or stupidity to tell anybody. <laughs> That because, you know, oh, because I'm, you know, because you're overstanding in this corner of the store, I'm not responsible for anything, right? Like, literally, you know, you, 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 we ran different businesses because there was different partnership arrangements, but that still didn't mean anything. Customers always get taken care of. So, here's what I'm going to say if you take your guitar to somebody and they damage your guitar, they're accountable for that. I know because it's why I teach and do repair on YouTube the way I do. Every time somebody tells me, hey, Phil, you don't need that nice tool or that thing that I'm doing or that that clean, like when people make fun of my clean surfaces and clean areas in my repair shop, they have never felt the pain of paying for somebody's guitar you've damaged. It it's it. I don't care if your guitar is worth $100. It's hard to make $100 repairing guitars. I just did a video, you guys will see it, it's on another channel, with Michael Tobias from Tobias Spaces, Dan Earlywine. Oh. Um, yeah, yeah, it was a bunch of us. We yeah. did this, and guess what? Dan one of the, Earlwine, Yeah, it. and here's what's funny thing about that, in that video, you'll see. We talk about how that we work in an industry where it's, the margins are small, that's fine. Not like, you know, some other <laughs> industries where our mistakes can literally tank an entire month's wages. And that's why you don't want to make mistakes. And that's why you want to use mats over people's guitars. That's why you handle your, you have your tools set up the way you do, right? Um, I, I I thought about doing this. I'll, I'll probably do it now because this video or this podcast, I was talking about doing a video talking about my shop, about why my pad is where it is where I repair guitars. Um, in sometimes in the shots you see two pads because I keep a pad, you know, on both benches. But the bench where I work on the guitar, none of the tools that I are in front of that guitar are for that. You know what I mean? So my screwdrivers, all the tools that I use to work on guitars, are actually away from the guitar. I don't pull any tools over the top of the guitar. So, anyways, back to this thing uh, with your guitar center problem. You definitely need to go to guitar center. You need to take pictures of the guitar. Um, this is why you want to... Hey, I keep mentioning this all the time. I'll keep mentioning it to, to, to the day I die. We we have cell phones. Man, when you take a guitar and repair, take pictures. I'm afraid of nothing, so you know. And I, and I say that because I want you to understand. Uh, as someone who's now has a YouTube channel and, of course, you know, doing repairs and done repairs now for 16, 17 years, Nathan can tell you, I'll do repair in front of you. I'll do... I don't care. If somebody came in, and I'm not insulted is what I'm trying to say. If you come in and say, hey, work on my guitar, and before I start working on it, you start taking pictures of your guitar, I wouldn't be like, hey, man, what are you trying to imply here? <laughs> I'd be like, I get it. In fact, I'll tell you exactly what would happen. I would, even though I'm cautious, I'd be even extra cautious because I'm like, this is a person who really cares about their guitar. One of the things, and again, I try not to get sidetracked too much on the show, but it happens. One of the things I, I always uh, tell my wife, and she's definitely learned to, to live by this, I tell my wife, never take the car in for repair unless you clean it first. Because you want the person who works on your your car to think that you care about your car. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that they'll care about your car. So when you bring in your guitar in, this is my advice. You bring your guitar into a tech, make sure it's wiped up. Make sure it's clean. Make sure it's in a case. Make sure your case is tidy. These are all signs that imply to that person that's touching your guitar. They should take those same precautions and be extra cautious as well and if you take pictures of your guitar before you hand it to them that saves you from a situation like that and in your case you're not saying that they're denying that they did the damage which is even worse if they did the damage they're accountable i, I and by accountable i don't mean that the repair is free and i don't mean that the their repair is a discount they have to fix that they have to fix it you could argue and some will in the comments you they should replace it that's a that's an argument, and if you that's your argument, that's fine. But I'm telling you from because I'm on both sides of the bench. Okay, I'm going to talk to you both sides of the bench. The minimum of what should be offered is your guitar should be returned to you in the same condition or better than you gave it to them. That's the minimum. I don't think anybody should disagree with that. That's insane. If if your guitar is scratched, it should be fixed. You know what I mean? Or, or compensated in some way. You know what I mean? Even if they're not able to like. Oh, it can't set this up. Like, at least it's not in worse. You know, it shouldn't be worse yeah. ever. Like yeah. giving it back to you, yeah. the same. That's an important distinction that you leave there. Is like it should be the same because they couldn't do the work, or it should be better because they were 
you're paying them to do the job. Yeah, it's it's I mean, it's just and again, it's just nice to hear this stuff because it's important that we all as a guitar community, we have these discussions. Some of us agree, some of us disagree, but I think those are some bare minimums. I think if you pay somebody to do something for your to your guitar, your guitar should come back in at least better condition. At the very worst, the same condition, which is actually sad too, should come in better condition than you than you left it. So in that case, what I would say is hold to your guns, is what I'm saying. Go to Guitar Center, talk to them. They're a big corporation. I understand that, but they're people. Talk to that person. Talk to the manager. They're a person. You know, get them to understand what you're talking about. Um, definitely, if you could, I would love to hear back from you. If you want to send it to asknowyourgear at gmail.com and just put in the subject title, you know, Guitar Center uh, Chipped PRS or whatever, and let me know. I would love to update the audience on what your res uh, what resolution you guys were able to come up with, with, with you and Guitar Center. Um, Maybe email PRS, too. See what they say. Yeah. I mean, they, they, you never know. What, like, the two main customer service guys over there are, are Sean and Matt. Yeah, and Sean and Matt. Email PRS. Why not? Why not? You know why? Because, again, it's, you know, it's a valid complaint. <laughs> you have a chip in your guitar. And uh, and uh, and then Mike's uh, saying it was an accident. It, it, accidents don't matter. I hate to say it, man. I, again, like I said, I'm talking to you, like I said, both sides of the, the counter here. Um, trust me, it sucks. <laughs> it's just like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw Nathan under the bus. <laughs> Remember, <laughs> he's smiling. You know what I'm going to say? No. Oh, remember my white PRS? I'll get, I'll get ready for it. Oh, <laughs> that's, that's not Okay, fun. so I had a white PRS, uh, S2. The single cut. Single cut, yeah. and then uh, it was on my bench, and then basically Nathan scratched it. Scratch it. I dropped it on a pedal. Yeah, he dropped it on a pedal. And the, it's it's like, oh, it wouldn't be that big of a deal. But it the neck dropped on a ditto, too. Yes. Because remember, somebody had brought in a broken ditto, too. Now, I this remember. is my guitar, not a customer's guitar. Yeah, so right and here. it fell, and it's like right where you put your thumb, there was a ding. And it's like the worst possible place for a ding, because you're going to feel it every time you're playing. And I felt so bad. Although, hey, now I can fix it. Yeah, see? <laughs> and and here's the funny part about that. I, I tell you that story because I, I'm not to actually throw Nathan under the bus. I tell you because, again, that was an accident. Nathan didn't damage it on purpose. It happens. And that's the, what I told him, I think, back then. I don't remember what I said to you. Yeah. But it was something to that effect, right? Uh, you know, there's no malice in that. It's a mistake. And I think I said something like, I've done, you know, worse and... It sucks. Yeah, I you know felt I mean? really bad about it. Yeah, you feel bad. And then, you know, we, we move on. And you, like I said, but when it's a customer, you take care of the customer, right? Um, we're friends. We take care of each other. We're all good. But uh, but uh, the main part of that is, again, whether it's an accident or not, they should take care of it. Agree. Definitely agree. Uh, Bobby says, Phil, reopen your business. You are an influencer now. Very different than old days. Uh, open a franchise. I'm still in business. I do repairs. I still do. I did 76 repairs last month. <laughs> I told myself I would never do more than 10 a week. That was my goal <laughs> with, with stopping to do. Uh, at the store, I don't know how many we were doing. I think 35 a week is how many I was knocking out or more. Uh, I try not to look on the sheet sometimes. <laughs> uh, so yeah, it's it's. I just don't sell guitars. Uh, which So you know, I only sold guitars to pay that rent. So I could repair guitars to pay my, to pay my living. Uh, so that's why when the YouTube started sucking up hours, uh, it's my buddy Joe, <laughs> uh, who did all this. He basically was the one who recognized that I was, I was burning up, burning out, you know, between running all this, all these separate entities, and then doing YouTube. So that's basically what I did. I stopped selling guitars uh, to do the, you know, because the YouTube took up so much time. Um, which is funny because now YouTube takes up even more time. <laughs> <laughs> but at least you do it like all from home pretty much. Yeah. I, what's nice now is I've learned to kind of merge as many of the things I have to do each week together. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's, uh, my biggest problem right now is, uh, and Nathan can tell you this, Nathan now is working at, obviously at Fender in the custom shop. It's cause of COVID. If Nathan wasn't, if it wasn't for COVID, uh, me and Nathan, were going to expand the repair shop. That was the plan, yeah. That was the plan. We were going to spare my... Because my, my, I'm at max. When people reach out to me for a pair, I'm like, all I think about is like the 10 or 15 guitars I'm behind on right now. So taking more guitars, it's really tough for me to say yes all the time. So, But I say yes as much as I can because I'm, you know, I only have so many hours in a day. So I was like, Nathan, we got to do this. We got to expand. And then literally 
we were talking about, I think like, like what, a week later. Yeah. A week later. Everything it was, like, shut it was down. literally last February. And I go, okay, here's what we're going to do. You're going to move back from Maryland. We're going to, this is how we're going to execute on this. And then literally within weeks or two weeks from that, they shut down all the States. Yeah. We got sent home for two months. Uh, and even then after then we were like, I, Phil and I were talking almost every week. Like, what's it look like? Does it look like we're it's going to let up anytime soon? And the answer for the past year has been no. No. So I saw another opportunity uh, to come back close, you know, go back yeah. to California and be with my family and, you know, do the job I'm currently doing for a little bit more money. You know, yeah. Can't, can't hate that. Yeah. And, and, and like I said, we're, we're still looking to that future. The problem right now, of course, is, uh, is it's simple. Uh, I, I don't want to sign an insane lease and th there's no deals out there in the real estate market where we live. Cause Arizona is exploding like a lot of places and it's not a good time to sign huge leases when we're still deciding what's going to happen month to month. Yeah. Um, so and there's no good places. Like we can't even the old, the old store that Bashes is gone. That grocery store. So yeah, that I whole com I I went to that complex today because I went to the to, I went to Las Fa Las Faves for for breakfast and there was like nobody in that nobody. entire shopping area. Yeah. So you guys know what he's talking about is the shopping center where my store was at, um, which is another reason why we didn't. You know, it was timing. Uh, we knew uh, before I made the announcement that I wasn't going to do the retail side anymore. We knew going into the new uh, agreement with the new lease, we had to sign a new lease coming up in a few months. The Bashes, which is the grocery store, was leaving. The uh, Petco left. The, the Zia. Starbucks left. Zia. The Zia left. In fact, if you go to that shopping center, it's, it was three, four years ago, right? Yeah. 2017. That shopping center looks like a wasteland now, basically, like yeah. what is what he's saying. And so, and so you know, they still are asking for the same amount of rent, which was like seven grand a month. Yeah. Um, okay, so... We got to get back to questions. Uh, we have the Apple Masher, Apple Smasher. Sorry, the Apple Smasher. He says, "Is Heritage guitars on par with Gibson for semi hollows? What about 335 versus 336, 339 semi hollows? I have a shop offering 25% off a new guitar. I like Heritage Ooh. better than Gibson. That's just what I I, I like. However, uh, and I've explained this. I bought a Gibson ES335 because I got a better deal than Heritage." That's essentially, that's exactly yeah. why I bought it. 25% uh, sounds like a pretty good deal. Yeah, yeah. I, I bought a Gibson 335 for a price that literally right now, if I was listed on Reverb, I would list it for, if I listed for what I paid for it, it would sell in an hour. So I wouldn't list it for that. I'd sell it for a little bit more than what I paid for it. And I bought mine brand new. So that's why I bought an ES335. It was, uh, it's a guitar I wanted. It was a good investment. What I wanted was a Heritage, but there was no deals on the Heritage. Um, they were hard to find at that time in the color and the weight I wanted, you know? Uh, so it's, I, I tell you that just to tell you constantly that, yes, I, I really want to buy a heritage. I'm probably going to eventually pull the trigger trigger on one. Um, and, uh, yeah, so, as far as Arn Parr is concerned, exact, they're definitely on. Par. Yeah. I think Maybe even a little bit better. Yeah. I think there might, I agree with him. There may be a little better. They make less of them. Uh, I like certain things about them. I mean, it's not again, and it, so you know that's not a saying anything negative about Gibson. I like Gibson yeah. too. You just got to get past the not Gibson headstock and certain, car, you know, certain curves of the guitar are just a little bit different. But other than that, as far as sound and yeah. how they play and how they look, they look gorgeous and they play awesome. So. I I'm lucky now. the The thing I got from the YouTube gig, uh, now that I reviewed like 500 guitars or some crazy <laughs> number like that, if you look through the videos, is insane. Um, I don't care about headstocks at all. I used to say that, you know, years ago, and I, I kind of meant it. Now I so much mean it, I don't even care. That's the last thing I care about anymore because I've learned that, you know, I used to say that all the time, you know, like everybody. I'm like, oh, man, it's a great guitar, but I can't get past that headstock. And here's what happened. That was really screwing things up for me because some of the ugliest headstocks are some of the best guitars. Um, and that's an opinion, so you know. I mean, because what you guys, you know, we could all right? All of us could put out what's an ugly headstock. I mean, there was a point in my life where I thought the Fender headstock was the ugliest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> I thought it was just horrible. And then it grew on me. Um, so, you know, and, and so, you know, I actually like g &L's headstock better than Fender's. And so that's just my preference. But I'm sure like 90% of you would disagree, which is fine, which is fine. I'm not even saying in that case, I'm not saying I, I tolerate the g headstock. I actually like it. The little... 
stupid piece thing. I like that. <laughs> I don't know why. It's, I mean, um, the Martin headstock has been just a rectangle for a hundred yeah. years, and it's just three lines, you know, and no, nobody complains about that. Yeah, it's it's weird. Yeah, it's a weird thing. I re- here's here's the thing I can tell you. If you can if you can figure out how to get past that mentally, man, it opens up the world to you because there's some goofy looking headstocks that are just just put a on, rag on it, just which are put on a towel stuck, on it. While yeah, you're which are stuck fine. on some some uh, uh, great guitars. To me, like one of the goofiest headstock is the McMill, uh, McMull. Sorry, McMull yeah, headstock. Yeah. And dude, I played some of those guitars. Some of the best playing guitars I've ever played. Yeah, really McMull. nice guys too. And nice guys too. Super. Yeah. Uh, were you with me when they gave us uh, espressos? Yeah, that yeah. was right because they were right next to like Vega Trim, uh at Nam, right? I uh, yep. I was walking the Nam show with Nathan. And we stopped by the McMull booth to say hi. And they were so, they were like, hey, how you doing? We're good. You guys thirsty? And I'm like, no. And he goes, oh, you want some coffee? And they made us espressos and gave us like espressos. Super cool guys. And like I said, the guitars played fantastic. And the headstock doesn't bother me. Um, in fact, so you know, um, I was actually planning to buy one. And then that was also with COVID. That was my big expense I had planned to buy last year. And yeah, then COVID happened. Yeah, those are crazy. Happened. They're made like turkey or israel I israel think. Oh, one yep. of the, okay i remember it was some and, somewhere and yes over there. they're expensive but man they were so good yeah they played really really they were nice. my favorite guitar i think i played at that show uh january of 2020 uh scott says scott says thank you for introducing me to lawrence petros uh he went out of his way to help me select the right pedal for my rig spectacular customer service look lawrence is a great guy uh i i you know i think there's no um misconception here when it comes to i like certain gu- brands i like certain products and so therefore i discuss and support those products when i can and then there's people in this industry that i like and then it's like a double whammy i like their products and them as a person and it's just it's just a great and lawrence is yes he's one of the nicest guys i remember when he came into the shop the first time yeah he I, i i uh it's so funny now thinking about it the first time i i think i've told the story the first time i met lawrence he came in the store and he was he was so polite. Remember? And he was like standing there and he didn't want to, I was just talking to somebody. We weren't even in business and he just would not interrupt. He didn't want to wait. And I finally said, can I help you? And he's like, I don't, you know, he was just so like, when you're ready, I don't want to take up your time. And he was, and he, he just wanted me to try the 68 pedal. Yeah. And, he had the 68 uh, and he had the first version of the 87. At yeah. The time. He had the, and, uh, which had, I remember specifically cause he, he's like, this is my 87. It was black with orange knobs. And I was like, Oh, so it's an HM2 clone. He's like, no. I'm like, anytime I see a black guitar or black pedal with orange knobs, I immediately think it's an HM2 clone. So I think he ended up going with the white after that. I remember um, the, I think I've told this story. Uh, what I lo- love about that experience was that was the day before, this is how I always remember this, the day I met Lawrence Petros. It was Thursday. I don't know what date. I don't know what year. I just know it was Thursday because Friday was the next day that, well, obviously the next day after Thursday, but Friday was the day that me, uh, Ralph, and Joe, I should say Joe, Ralph, and me, went to Sam Ash and filmed the What Guitar Would I Buy for $500? 500, yeah. And I remember I bought the guitar and the amp, and when they were ringing up, I was paying cash, and I was I tried other stuff, and you know, obviously I tried everything I could in the store, and one of the things I tried was a JHS pedal, and I was going to buy it. And we were ringing up, and at the last minute, we edited out of the video because it didn't pertain. I said, "Yeah, I'm gonna hold off on the JHS pedal." And the and the guy at the at Sam Ash was like, "Are you sure?" And I'm like, "Well, this other guy brought me a pedal yesterday, and I really need to try it out." And <laughs> like, I you know, I mean, I'm just gonna wait. <laughs> so I went home, and that's the weekend I plugged the the JHS art the JHS the uh, LPD pedal, the 68, which I still have to this day, and still the pedal I use the most uh, into my uh, Fender amp, and just fell in love. Yeah, the so, 68 is awesome. I love it. Um, Joan, John Own 6 can't play any Roddy. <laughs> any Roddy. I'm sure it's all phonetic, right? John Own 6 can't. I don't know. I don't know what that is. It's a long name. It says, Happy Friday. Had my first Zoom guitar lesson last week. It was tough. Couldn't see, couldn't hear. Any recommendations for re- good remote lesson setup, interface, and camera? Um no, uh, it's a good question, uh, but it's not really a thing I'm really versed in. I hate Zoom because <laughs> I feel like every I Zoom now all the time with all these companies, and because no companies now, for some reason, because of COVID, can talk on the phone. They only do face to face Zooms. Ooh, I'm losing my voice. 
You want a cough drop? I got cough uh, yeah. And, uh, and, and, um, uh, I use my Mac. So this is how lazy I am. And I have a Mac. <laughs> so I'm, I'm a horrible person to ask. Um, I do the same thing for zoom. I got a MacBook and I just plug in some headphones. Yep. I have a MacBook and I just literally, it does everything. I, I'm, it's, that's how stupid it is. <laughs> so, um, so suggestions, I, I hope some of the, the viewers will put some suggestions on what to use. Cause I'm, it's not very practical if you don't have a Mac to go out and buy one. They're very pricey and you don't need one by any no. means. Um, I've said this before and, and, uh, I'll say it again. I have all Mac, uh, my, every, all my kids have Mac. My wife has Mac. Everybody has Mac. And it's because I am not a computer person. Mac is <laughs> for me is for people who are not into that stuff. I'm not into that stuff. Um, I need it for this, this, you know, this YouTube experience that I'm doing. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, it works for me and, and, it, and it works great. Um, but yeah, I'm not. Unfortunately, I don't know what to suggest. Yeah. Um, what I will tell you though is uh, focus on your lighting because if you're not seeing really well, it's probably the lighting. I don't know. Yeah, ring. I mean, you could buy like a ring light off of like any Walmart or anything for not very much money, and those make a world of difference. Yes. If yes. you're going to use an interface, like maybe like a Focusrite 2i2, they're, you know, not yeah. crazy expensive and they work really nice. Microphone on one for you to talk into and then you just run your guitar direct into the uh, into the other side. Because I assume if you're just doing lessons, you're not like doing pedals or plugins or anything like that. Your guitar just needs to sound, just needs to produce a couple notes. So 2i2 probably be a great one. I think the solo will run one instrument and one microphone, Oh yeah, I think. But the 2i2 will run to um xlr inputs and both of the xlr inputs can do a quarter inch as well the next question is i see everything twice <laughs> i recently discovered that the more and more gear i end up creating more sounds that are almost identical at some point more gear equals diminishing returns question mark um it depends well, that depends. I, I can only tell you exactly the way I look at uh, obviously you're looking behind me, you see guitars, you see Nathan. And there's my amps behind Nathan. Uh, I don't use uh, different gear each day. That's not ex not even close. I don't do that. I don't. I have. I've never done that. I've never uh, like for my. You know, this is. I use my Fender for my clean sound, and I use you know my Marshall for this sound, and it's my '70s rock sound, and I use the you know the Mark V Mini for the metal sound. Um, I I've never. I don't do that. What I do is I play something. So right now, what am I into right now? I'm into my uh, 2061, which is why it's over here, my Marshall 2061, which is over in the other corner, and um, running a couple pedals into that right now. And I'll play that for weeks, and that's just what I play. And then one day, I plug into it, and I go, hmm, this is not, <laughs> it's not doing it for me. And then I'll switch, and then all of a sudden, I'll, I'll try one of my other amps. And so to me, having a few amps, I have... Uh, Amps are easy. They're not like the guitars, okay, for me. Uh, when I mean for you guys, I should say. What you see is what I have. <laughs> I have an amp down in the shop. I have an amp in my bedroom. And then I have the amps you see behind Nathan and one other. So I think I have nine amps total, which is a lot of amps, but uh, that's what I have. Um, so, uh, yes, is there diminishing returns? Of course, of course. How many, you know, that's the old question, how many do you need? Uh, you don't need any, but, you know, you should have one, one amp, one guitar. Um, but like I said, it depends on what you're trying to get out of it. I don't think uh, you should worry about, I guess, how many different sounds you can get or how much alike they sound. I want all my stuff to sound alike. <laughs> it, it's uh, I don't play the Fender to get a totally separate, different sound than my Marshall. I generally try to find the same sounds. I just want a different experience because, again, you do kind of... I look at this stuff. It's like uh, somebody said... Um, uh, I don't know what they said. What did they say? They said, yeah. basically, you don't need all this stuff. And I'm like, right. But you don't need to go to different restaurants either. You know what I mean? There's all kinds of things you don't need. It's you need... You want to have different experiences. Um. That, I don't know. You got I, def any thoughts I on definitely that? agree, but also I own like 13 of the same pedal because I have all of those DOD envelope filters. But so. that's different too. That's See, that falls into, and again, <clears throat> this is why these conversations are always great. Th what you're talking about, in my opinion, falls into collecting now. 
Yes, I'm definitely a, a hardcore collector of the DoD envelope filters. Right. Um, but for me, that's why I like pedals is because it's an easy way to just change my sound real quick. It's like, Absolutely. oh, this this distortion isn't quite what I want. Well, I could just throw a rat or, you know, like a Earthquaker Plumes or something or a Lawrence Petra 68 or something like that. Just I can just throw it in there into my chain and like even just having a big collection of pedals, even if I don't use them, sometimes just walking into my garage like I have a bunch of pedals I can play. Well, I, I'll just play guitar anyway. Like, sometimes that's enough to, to get me to pick yeah. up the guitar. And whatever you have that gets you to pick up the guitar, and then and then that thing that you own is doing its job, I feel. Well, and amps are luxuries, too. I mean, yeah. uh, they're all, all this stuff is luxuries, but I, I really, uh, I have no problem with, if I was ever put in a position, and I might be one day, you never know. Things happen in life. You go up and down in your life in all kinds of ways. I've been in every up and down you can be in at this point. Um, like if all of a sudden tomorrow I had to sell off all my crap, which could happen, uh, I, everybody knows I do the same thing. Everybody would probably do the same. I would pick one of the amps, probably like my fender that I like one of my fenders, you know, pick that amp and then probably three or four pedals. I really just need a bunch of pedals and an amp. I can achieve every sound. It's fine. <laughs> That'd be a really hard choice for me. Yeah. Mostly because my collection of guitars isn't very big right now, and each of them means something, which is why I still have held on to them. So it'd be very, very hard to narrow narrow down. Like You're talking about the guitars? Yeah, just if I were to get rid of all of them but one, it'd be hard. It's like, I've got my employee PRS. I worked there for four years to get that guitar. I have this the Custom 22 I bought from you. I have the Tremonti that was the first PRS ever sold at, at our old shop. Like, it's all, I, I couldn't. I don't think I could possibly ever narrow it down, so I try not to think about that. Yeah, well, you already know. We are when we talk about pairing, you know, getting rid of stuff. We know what we're talking <clears> about. You're broke. You need money. Yeah, got to go. Then I just pick the highest item, which unfortunately probably would be my employee guitar. Yeah, because that would go in a second for a crazy amount of money. So, uh, you know, I don't know. All right, next question. <laughs> These are, I like these questions. Sometimes they we go, I go down roads and we go down roads that I don't think we're going to go down. Uh, Shawnee's a Cubs fan says, Hey guys, what do you think of Fender Highway 1 series? Uh, I got a 2007 uh, Highway 1 Telecaster and I love it. Cheers from Chicago. I would have swore we talked about this once before. Highway 1 series uh, was the series that were satin nitro uh, bodies and with the 70s headstock. They were great. I think they had jumbo frets too. Something cool and different. I've always liked them. They were used to be dirt cheap. Now they're kind of like everything. The price keeps going up. You ever played one, Nathan? Yeah, I think Jimmy had one. Yeah, they were in like a sun, like a really, really light sunburst. It wasn't like the tricolor sunburst where it was black and went to brown and then yellow. It was like brown on the outside and went to yellow on the inside. That was a pretty cool guitar. I liked it. Yeah, and they are... We were talking about headstocks earlier. I'm not crazy on '70s headstocks, but it also wouldn't keep me from buying a guitar. Yeah, I well, I used to be the same way. I'd be like, oh, I hate the 70s headstock, and it's, now I'm like, uh... It'd be funny, I'm just kind of thinking about it, it'd be funny to do a Charvel with a huge headstock, like the tiny little Charvel logo and then a huge headstock. It's just picturing it in my mind looks silly. I have a I have a job for you uh, when you go back uh, to California, since you're working for Charvel now. Uh, ask around and find out if this is true. I was told this once as a rumor, and I don't want to look it up on the internet... <laughs> Because I figure if you're working there, you'll find out. I was told that uh, the Charvel logo, because it's small, was small on all the headstocks. But when they would make artist guitars, they would make the Charvel logo bigger. So artist guitars, like artists, not like signature artist guitars. We're talking about back yeah, in the yeah, day when anybody, they would make a guitar an for an artist. Yeah, they yeah. would make the logo bigger. And so when you see uh, when you saw a bigger logo on one of the Charvels, it was probably made for an artist. Even if that was a you know a smaller artist, you know anybody who was getting any kind of artist deal. Um, I've heard that story so many times, uh, but I figure since you're working there now, I'm sure yeah. somebody's. Or maybe out. like using the toothpaste logo instead of the yeah the guitar logo. That would make sense. I mean, that's the whole reason why Fender did the or CBS did the '70s headstocks anyway, right? Yeah. So yeah, so that's your mission. <laughs> uh, we have uh, Grave Digger Dale says, "Phil, thanks for the suggestion to try reverb for an amp. I got a 10 watt Vox with enough to get oh, oh enough left over to get the Line Six M5." Dude, you're per you're set up. You're perfect now. Yeah, M5 is uh, awesome. Yep i I used to dig graves when I was younger, hence the nickname. <laughs> that's that's a job, dude. <laughs> I mean, that's what they always say, right? The world needs ditch diggers, and that's no, but what that's a grave digger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it's oh yeah, yeah we yeah physically uh, what you're doing. I feel it. Yeah, but it's important. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah, grave 
suck. That's scary. Oh but, wait, was he a grave digger or was yeah, he, he or was he, he the monster dig... truck driver? No, no, grave no. Digger? He, yeah, not the yeah, not the monster truck. <laughs> he used to 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 dig graves when he was younger. Hence the nickname, Grave Digger Dale. <laughs> Dale. <laughs> That's a good thing to clear up because otherwise you're like this guy's you're like what's what's with the grave digger thing? Um, somebody Jeff, somebody asked if they tried if you've tried the sire guitars. You just did that single cut, didn't you? Mm. Here's a cool thing, um, and I try not to share stuff, you know, because uh, it gets scary when I share things and then it doesn't happen. You know, it doesn't come to fruition. But this kind of happened. Let me tell you a, a cool story with the sire guitar. I really want to share it. So I had a I had a, a pretty much crappy week this week. <laughs> <laughs> and so this was the highlight uh, besides Nathan coming up for the weekend and stuff. So so here's what happened. I did the, uh, you guys, uh, you guys suggested, please check it out, Sire. Please check out Sire. Please check out Sire. Um, and um, so I did what we, we discussed. I bought a Sire. I bought the Sire L7. It was really amazing. It was probably one of the only guitars in the last couple months that I bought that I was just like trying to come up with any reason to justify not to let it go. Cause that's the deal. I, I, I buy it, we review it, I sell it. I sell it to, to kind of churn the money so I can buy another guitar till we can keep doing these videos and um, really enjoyed that guitar. And that video did well. It's like 112,000 views and that, you know, you can't predict this. You can buy 5,000 views. You can get hundred thousand views. You never know what's going to happen in the YouTube universe. Um, I was extremely excited because when the videos do that well and after you factor, you know, you're selling all the stuff, it's nice if I'm netting some kind of profit at the end, right? It makes you feel good about the two days of work it takes to film those videos. The The reason I'm telling you the story is because this is what happened this week. It was really cool. I think it was on Thursday, might have been Wednesday. The owner of Sire Guitars emailed me. Very nice guy. I think his name's Kyle. And he said, uh, and I probably have that wrong. I'm sorry if I do. <laughs> he said, hey, I saw the video. I really enjoyed it. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, thank you for doing the video. And he said, look, I know you have this desire to be independent. And I really appreciate that. If you ever want to buy any Sire guitars, I'll sell them to you at a discount. And he goes, uh, and you please say whatever you want. And please call out any mistakes or anything on the guitars. He's like, we can only learn from anything you say. You know, feedback, right? Very, very polite, uh, uh, you know, email. So I responded in kind uh, with, hey, thank you so much. I appreciate, you know, you reaching out. And uh, I'll, you know, I'll keep an ear out. You know, if the audience wants me to check out any more of these Sire guitars, I'll uh, hit you up, you know. And if I can do anything for you, let me know. And he emailed me yesterday, like it's two days later, he emailed me yesterday and said, hey, we had a meeting and, you know, we don't want to, we don't want to, you know, push anything on you, but we'd love to send out a couple Sire guitars to do reviews. So they're sending the H7, which is the hollow body, the S7, and the S7 flamed. And uh, here's what he said. This is great. He said, uh, we're going to send these guitars out, and um, you can review them. You can not review them. We just we love what you do. We love your community. And uh, he sent it out. So what I love with that is kind of in the, the, the philosophy I like to follow when I can, you know, as much as you can. I was so excited. I was like, wow, this is great because I'm really excited about the uh, H7. I'm checking that out. Um, I know a lot of you guys talk about the T7, but I guess it's not out yet. The reason I'm telling you that is what's going to happen is I'm going to definitely review all three of those guitars and then we'll give uh, one away, right? Um, I might give away multiples, but like I said, I have to pay the shipping and stuff. So, I mean, you got to make this make sense, but I, I'll like to do a video where I'll review it and we'll do something cool and we'll give it away or something. So, uh, I just thought that was cool, right? That stuff's cool. when that happens. Uh, I remember when like Sire first came out, I was still working at the shop and the big thing, their big poll was Marcus Miller. And it was, we were questioning, like he went from custom shop fender bases to, they were like what, six, 700 bucks uh sire bases and i've still never played one to this day so for the past almost five years i've been thinking in that same way but watching your video about the yeah i watched the whole thing about the the, the l7 and it made me like think back on those bases and want to try one of the bases it's a no-brainer for me uh the l the the sire series stuff you can tell what they're doing they're they're using sorry they're using a, a nice indonesian manufacturer making a nice indonesian guitar that we've all put our hands on they're spending, as you know, because Nathan, you know, builds these expensive guitars. He can tell you exactly what I'm... He's going to back up what I'm about to say, I'm sure. They're putting an extra hour worth of hands-on time on it. 
And that's really what it takes in the factory, right? Yeah. About I an mean, hour, about yeah. an hour and a half of extra I mean, hand time. I mean, sometimes like even five minutes of paying attention more can make a huge difference. When I was at PRS, uh, like a year and a half ago, they gave uh, everybody in the factory a t-shirt. It was either pink or black, long sleeve or short sleeve. You got to pick. And it said five minutes now can save an hour later. And so it sounds like that's exactly what Sire is doing. It's like we can save the headache of getting this guitar sent back to us if we just do the work right the first time. And that's so, so important, especially in a factory setting like that where people can get burnt out on working on, on a ton of guitars a day. And if you give them time to make sure they're doing their work correctly, they'll be happier employees overall and you will get a better product at the end of it. Absolutely. So I thought I'd share that with you guys. Like I said, um, uh, he wanted me to pick out colors and stuff. I'll do that. And, um, and like I said, uh, I thought it would work out great. And uh, I'll let you guys know, you know, when they come in and I'll do the videos and we'll do some something fun, the giveaway. We'll do some excitement stuff with it, right? We'll do some exciting. Um, you know, the next one uh, is from Jeff. Jeff says, for Nathan, love your work. That's me. I have <laughs> I have one you did from PRS. He has got one of your, your guitars. Uh, how do you how do you do something like Jackson Widow Graveyard, etc.? I don't know what that means. So Jackson know. Widow. That might be like a, um, like the, remember like they used to have pile, pile of skulls and stuff like that. That might be like a specific design. Yeah. And uh, some specific designs are done by Dan Lawrence. If it's a graphic, the guitar gets shipped out to Dan Lawrence. Dan Lawrence puts the graphic on, it comes back and then we clear it. Or um, uh, he also does airbrush stuff. Same thing. He does all any kind of little detailing airbrush. We'll go to Dan Lawrence. Um, I think he has his own guitar brand too, GMP Guitars, but Dan Lawrence will handle most of that kind of specific graphic stuff and then it'll come back. If it's like a swirl, you know, like Eerie Death Swirl, we still do those in-house. Um, but yeah, I th if, if it is what I'm thinking of, which is like a crazy airbrushed graphic, then it'll either be a decal or wrap that's done by Dan or that facility will also do some of the airbrushing stuff. Now, that's awesome what you're saying. So you guys... I hope you're paying attention to what he's saying. I just learned something. So that would make sense because GMP guitars, like I know CC DeVille's playing them. Those guitars have crazy awesome finishes and crazy graphics and crazy, right? Really cool stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, that would make sense that that's where he comes from. That's the lineage and why it transfers over because as you know, you know, there's tons of guitar companies are everywhere, right? Especially smaller ones. They're just everywhere. Yeah. But it's, you know, you tend to find that the luthiers, uh, the designers, they, they, they kind of, you know, lean into their attributes. So that would make sense why their finish, their finishes look so cool. Yeah. I guess Dan Lawrence was a Jackson custom shop guy. And then he started doing this and he still does Jackson custom shop stuff with the graphics, but then also has his own, his own line. That's really cool. The next one is from Cheddar Kung Pao. What's up, Cheddar? Cheddar says, "This is this is uh, this is for you, Nathan. Let's yeah. see. Ready? What is the best envelope filter ever made?" Well, that's an easy easy answer. Well, sort of, because I can say DoD envelope filter, but there's like five DoD envelope filters. There's the 440. There's the 440 reissue, uh, designed by Tom Cram. Uh, there's the FX25, the FX25B. There's the old Performer Series Auto Wah. But uh, my favorite would probably be the FX25, which is the old two knob one. Right. Uh, and then is that I, the one I sent you? Um, which yes, is the one I yeah, sent the you? one that you, one of the ones you sent me is an FX25. Um, the B is the three knob one that you like with yep, the because um, that has the blend knob. Um, so my favorite is DOD. And when I first started buying DOD envelope filters, they were like thirty and forty bucks, and yep. now you can't find them under a hundred dollars because um, Josh from JHS has done two videos now, one about DOD and another where he talked about his pedal board when he was a kid. Right. And he has an FX 25 B on his pedal board as a kid. And so the price is just shot way up. And luckily I already had like 10 of them at the time. So I'm not going to get rid of them anytime soon, but if I was broke, that's what I'd start selling off envelope filters. I got my first boss or DOD. Sorry. got my first DOD, uh, envelope filter at guitar center. Um, I wanted the EBS one for my bass, EBS the brand. Mm -hmm. And there was another one that was out there was really expensive. They were all expensive, like 200 bucks. Yeah. And I was I was like, $200 is like $2,000. You know what I mean? That's the thing about money. It's uh, That's why I always love when everybody has opinions about what shit stuff should cost and stuff. Um, because, you know, it's all internal. 
You know what I mean? I've had moments in my life where two hundred dollars felt like two million. <laughs> and, and you know, sometimes two hundred dollars is just like, eh, you know, let's do it. What do we got to lose? Um, but at that time in my life, it was uh, two hundred dollars was just insane. Like I wouldn't even consider that for pay that for an amp at that time in my life. And I really wanted an envelope filter. And I was at the guitar center one day, and they were playing videos on screens. And it was on Flea. It was an instructional video of Flea. And and the only reason I chimed in besides the fact it's Flea was he was talking about how he why he plays Music Man. In this in this video, it's an actual like instructional video, on, like how to slap bass, and it's Flea saying, "Why do you play Music Man?" He's like, "Oh, I love them." He goes, "When I was a kid, I always wanted one, but they were super expensive." And he goes, "And then I got rich." And he goes, "And once I got rich, I was gonna buy one, but now they give them to me for free." <laughs> and I was like, I was impressed with that candor. And I'm watching it, and then he started playing with the DoD envelope filter, and he said, "This is the one I use." And he goes, and it, and he recorded a ton of songs with it. And, uh, like you said, I went to the counter and there was one for 25 bucks and I'm like done. Yeah. And I've never used any other envelope filter. Uh, I, ever since that's the one I use. Yeah. Flea, Bootsy Collins, and then Johnny Greenwood from, um, from Radiohead are the three big, like DOD envelope filter guys. The one that Johnny Greenwood used was the old, uh, 440 and those, the vintage 440s go for like 300 bucks. And I managed to find one at guitar center for 50 bucks and immediately bought it. Yep. And, and, you know, that's the cool part. You know, it's always cool when you can find that cool piece of gear. I'm excited on a side note, guys. I just got three of them so far. I got one today and two last week. I You remember when I bought the, um, on the show, for those of you who watch the podcast pretty regular, we bought, I bought six Behringer pedals. I got three of them so far from oh, Sweetwater. Wow. They've been trickling in. So. Yeah, I heard like the Super Fuzz came back in stock this week and a bunch of people got that yeah so as soon as uh as soon as i get all the other three i'll put the port pedal board together i'll do a video for sure i'm excited about it um grumpy mike hey grumpy mike i was watching one of your videos yesterday the video i watched yesterday was your shootout with all the practice amps um i watched the video i'm going to tell you right now i watched the video because um well because it came in my feed but <laughs> but also Last weekend, me and uh, Ralph were at Guitar Center, and when we were walking to Guitar Center, there was a guy returning a practice amp, a little practice amp, and uh, and we were watching him, and we were laughing, and we both laughed. I don't know why this is stupid, but we both laughed, and we both laughed because we had the same thought was, he's returning that practice amp because he doesn't want to practice anymore. <laughs> but we thought that was the dumbest thing to think, but I guess we thought it. Um, so then I saw your practice shootout video, and I was like, oh, I'm curious about it. So you did a great job, great video. Uh, if you guys are interested in it, he just shoots out. He did his Spark, his Katana, his, I think his Vox, his Orange, uh, and uh, some he the headphone thing, the the Donner headphone thing. And he walked you through the logic of all of it. Um, so there you go. Um, there you there you go. The only suggestion, I, I, want, I don't want to do this public, but I just want to give it to you, because you don't have to take this suggestion at all. It's just my own suggestion. <laughs> I love the fact that at the beginning of your videos, you're like, hey, I bought these things. It's my opinion. No one, you know, no one, no one paid, no one sponsored. Um, the only thing I tell everybody about that is I think it's cool to mention that, you know, like I mentioned, like, hey, I bought this thing, but never try to give the audience. This is my suggestion to all you guys. Never try to teach the audience that because you bought it, it's now honest. <laughs> you're, you know, I can tell from all your videos, you're always honest. You just want to tell people what what your bias might be, right? I, I feel like I'm always giving you guys my honest opinion about something, but I need to disclose the bias. What is the bias involved in this? You know, if I bought it, you know, that's my bias. I'm out my money. If a company sent it, that's my bias. They sent it. There's always going to be some kind of bias. I love when we have some people say I like unbiased views, but uh, reviews. But to me, all 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 opinions are biased in something, <laughs> right? Um, so let's get to your question. He says, for the tone jar and why not? For the record, Nathan doesn't finish guitars. He creates works of art. <laughs> sort of. I make them shiny. I make them real shiny. And then now at Fender, I do a lot more. Or at Jackson, like whatever you want to call it. At PRS, I made them shiny. And what I do at Fender now is anything they want me to. They just throw me to a bunch of different departments. But thank you, man. I appreciate that. You know, it's, it's kind of what I'm going for here. I'm living my passion. And I get to work on crazy, awesome guitars every day. And, you know, who can hate that? Yes. So I appreciate it, man. Thank you for the comment. Um, there was a good question, too. Uh, this came from Marcel. He said, hey, Phil and Nathan, 
so he's he's mostly talking to you, but he, you know, I'm in there. He says, what is the ideal temperature, humidity conditions, temperature and humidity conditions for spraying nitro with a rattle can? Rattle can nitros are something that I have not used at all. It kind of scares me. Like nitro, like you can't even spray it in certain states and stuff like that right. because of the, the toxicity and it getting into the air and they don't want it to pollute or anything. So, I mean, if if you're telling if you're asking me, like, what are the best conditions, like do it in your garage and make a drip wall, you know, like where you have water on every side catching any kind of droplets. That's ideal. That's the absolute ideal. But we're talking about essentially a, in a, set, uh, a professional setup at that point. But, right. I mean, you're going to want room temperature anywhere between, like, I'd say, like, 70 to 77 degrees. If you're doing it outside, like, you want no wind, probably a clear sky, you know, nothing that can, you know, you don't want an accidental chance of rain or anything like that. And if there are clouds in the sky, like, it's going to rain the next day, even if it's not currently raining outside, you've got a humidity level that's now completely different. Um, than where you're going to be drying it in. So I'd say, yeah, any, anywhere between 70 to 77 degrees. And, like, if you're not in a rush, just wait till a, till a nice sunny day outside. You know huh. what I mean? Just just wait. Don't try to, you know, oh, I think I'm going to beat the clouds today. You know, because <laughs> if, if you don't beat the clouds, then your guitar is ruined and you got to sand it all off or wipe it down with acetone and do it all over again. So those are my, that would be probably me, probably my recommendations. Here's a good question, too. It says, Nathan, I have a satin nitro private stock, which I'm assuming means PRS. Yeah, yeah. And a satin, a satin, satin, a satin <laughs> nitro Jackson Charvel, USA. The Jackson Charvel nitro feels more durable and doesn't buff. Shine, uh, sh- in other words, doesn't shine under yeah, use yeah. like PRS nitro. Uh, he says, what's the difference? So the, the biggest difference there is... Um, Jackson Charvel is going to be satin nitro over poly top coat and uh, PRS is satin nitro over nitro. So you've got kind of a softer finish on the PRS as it is. Um, so Okay, you got to explain that because I think a, a lot of people... Okay, so... Um, so what you're saying... I just uh, Well, let me walk through it just because I want to make sure I understand too. So what you're saying is in, with the Jackson situation, they're shooting poly, polyurethane. For... For their satin guitars, yeah. Their polyurethane, like you you spray them like normal guitars. So up until the point where they need to be, where the PRS or the Jackson needs to be satin. And this doesn't include the satin PRS um, S2s because that's a completely different thing. But if you've got a private stock, then what it likely is, without looking at the spec sheet in front of me, what it likely is is nitro with a nitro uh, satin nitro on top of it. So up until the point where they need to be sprayed nitro, the guitars are finished like a normal nitro guitar or a normal poly guitar. And then you sand that flat just like anything else. And then you scuff it up so that way you can take another, um, another coat on top of it. And that's your satin nitro coat. So the private stock will be nitro with the satin nitro on top, on top. Whereas the, uh, Charvel EVH or Jackson will be polyester with, uh, satin on top so you're talking about yeah you've got the satin nitro on top that's completely you know that's there but underneath it there's a different finish and sometimes too like on the case of the um like the jeff loomis neck on the jackson that we make right now that is the body like the entire guitar is sprayed with poly and then just the neck uh up into the top of the headstock is scuffed up again so it can do a, uh, a layer of nitro and sometimes like the PRS SEs, those necks for like the Mark Holcomb and I think the Zach Myers is currently satin, I think. Um, those are sanded satin. I don't think they've actually put any satin nitro on top of that. So it's just like basically sanded to to feel like that. So to get to the basis of your question though, yeah, there's a satin nitro top coat, but right underneath that there's a polyester top coat on the Jackson and the just straight up nitro top coat on the um on the PRS and that will definitely affect the way that the nitro is going to react over time. Cause it's like I mentioned earlier in the cast, nitro reacts to anything you put on top of it. So even if it's just more nitro, that's going to react different than putting satin nitro on top oh. of polyester. Um, Michael put a question. I don't understand it. So hopefully you'll understand it. It says tip tips is you want to paint tinted clear over stock poly question mark or sand back poly question mark tips if you let's 
I, so I see the question here. I got it on my screen. Painted tinted clear over stock poly. I wouldn't say it. If you're just doing like a tinted clear, like I ha, like if you have a natural guitar and you're like, I just want to spray red over it so you can see through the red a little bit. No, you don't need to sand back the poly. You just need to scuff up the poly. And you could probably do that. You could do that with like four. Take all the parts off and do that with like 400 grit sandpaper. Just do it kind of light or use like a sanding sponge and just make sure you get all of the um, do it. Do it completely so where you can't see any shiny spots, and then just with a sanding sponge, do it all the same direction. Sorry, I just kind of put a big S right into the microphone. <laughs> but just make sure all of your strokes with the sanding um, sanding sponge are going the same direction, and then you can lay the clear on top. Yeah, so the hardest part of doing that guitar is already done, which is making sure your polyester is completely flat. So it's if you already own the guitar and it's a brand-new guitar, then the polyester is already flat, and all you need to do is scuff it up with 400 grit and a sanding sponge, and then, yeah, you can just lay your tinted clear on top of that, and you'll be fine. So two, two things. Uh, Tactical 6 String wants to know if you have a YouTube channel. Um, I mean, I have, like, a video of me buffing a guitar and demoing a Lawrence Petros pedal, but as far as just having an actual YouTube channel, uh, no, I've thought about doing it. I actually have a couple ideas for different types of content. I have a podcast I did like eight episodes of playing oh. a tabletop role-playing game. And then my dad and I were talking about doing a comic book podcast uh, slash YouTube thing. But as far as like demos and stuff, if you look up Lawrence Petr, uh, LPD Molnir, M-J-O-L-N-I-R, then you'll find a video of me demoing a pedal. And you can just kind of scroll through that channel. I've got some random videos on there. I've got a video of me buffing uh, my employee guitar all the way through. That's kind of cool. Oh. Uh, but as far as an I official, think I that one. yeah, as far as an official guitar channel or anything like that, no, you follow me on Instagram, which my Instagram name is, uh, I am Thorgis. So it's just like gorgeous, but with Thor in front of it instead. And then I have a page on Facebook. I'm not very active on it anymore. just called guitar talk. And I used to be way more active and then I got into the industry and I don't really use that Facebook page as much because I don't want to. You know, I work for a company now, so I don't yeah. want people to think I'm, you know, doing this as, right. you know, I, I pimp, I, even right now, I pimp PRS a lot because I still love, you know, I love PRS guitars. I didn't sell any of mine when I moved. Um, but having a personality page like that or influencer page while working for a brand is something I, I haven't started one yet. I'm not saying I couldn't, but I haven't started one yet because I haven't figured out the way that I'd want to run something like that. And yeah, and, and and I don't know if that I don't know if it was uh do you think that's also cuz of what Nathan, you know, obviously has been my friend for a long time. He remembers when I started the YouTube channel and the drama. <laughs> Do you remember the drama of my videos in the beginning with the companies I was Yes. Yes. So that was super fun. Uh, yeah, it was super fun. So you basically, so you guys know what we're talking about. When I had the store and I started doing YouTube, my YouTube channel was not my... I had a store YouTube channel. We were doing, you know, like every store. Hey, buy this thing. Yeah. <laughs> and then I started a YouTube channel. Uh, it was mine. It was for me. And so I would talk about things I was interested in. And, you know, and, and like Nathan said, it's tough. Um, it's tough to have a social presence talking about things um i found that uh in my case it literally got very heated very negative with companies that i was in business with with my store and then giving opinions they really did not enjoy that at all yeah i definitely know what you mean like i'm i'm on a bunch of guitar forums right now and uh, the biggest one that i'm on everybody knows that i was working at prs so anytime somebody suggested something and i'm like oh you should buy this prs and people are like, well, of course you're going to say that. Like, you work yeah. at PRS. Like, well, yeah, but I work at PRS because I love the product. I moved right. across the country to work at PRS because of how much I love these guitars. So, yeah, my opinion is a little bit biased, but it comes from a place of, like, knowing what I'm talking about and enjoying the product that I want to tell you to buy. And even right now when somebody asks stuff, like, I still suggest PRSs. I suggest Jacksons. I suggest Gibsons. Like, it Rick, does, uh, doesn't make no, a difference. Uh, Gretches? Yeah, Gretch. Gretch fan? It doesn't, doesn't make any difference to me. Uh, which actually one of the Gretsch builders was uh, watching a little while ago. She messaged me. Oh. <laughs> the, um, uh, so, uh, hold on. I'm looking for anything that's... Since... Oh, somebody looks like somebody just followed me on Instagram. Yeah, I'm, I'm I think that was Amanda. Now. Amanda just said she followed you too. Darren James. By the way, Amanda, 
uh, Coombs, who's one of the moderators. I'll be on Ben Coombs' channel this Sunday. He posted a link in the comments. Oh, well, there you that. go. Yeah. Check he told that everybody, out. Post it again, Ben, because uh, he, he said that you're going to be on the show. Click this to set a reminder. So I did so, notice that in the chat earlier. The uh, So I'm excited about that. So I'm just letting everybody know. So you can go check out Ben Coombs' channel on Sunday or just check it out now. Just leave this live show right now and just go watch his videos. <laughs> Somebody says, does Charvel have a 24 and three quarter inch scale model currently? I don't think so, but what were the, do you remember what the desolation? Cause that's before I, I started working there, but the desolation, desolation was like a shorter scale. I thought wasn't they were, it? I thought they were, I thought they were 24 and three quarters, but I could be. Yeah. Wrong. They were, I think they were, if not, they were maybe 25 cause they had that PRS, that one that was definitely going after PRS. So it might have like a smaller scale length on those check. It's worth checking out one of the desolations. The, Other than that, I think everything's 25 and a half and above. The next question from Steve says new guitar week times two yes <laughs> all right prs s2 custom 24 faded blue smoke burst epiphone les paul custom silver burst Ooh, silver burst he says love i uh, love your work phil great combination of guitars yeah. uh i like i said i i can't say anything bad about either one of those, those man are good if picks. you like silver burst uh nicholas over at the axe palace he's doing a run of silver burst velas oh they look i saw the mock-ups they look really really cool you know what, Steve, what's funny? You know what I like about those two guitars you got? The the S2 PRS guitar and the Epiphones, they have, I think it's funny when people talk about, you know, headstocks and brands and all this stuff. There's certain, not only brands, but models and brands have vibes, right? So like brands have vibes. Okay. That makes sense, right? Um, when I think of the S2 guitars from PRS, when I think of Epiphone guitars, I think of like, this is the guitar you get if you really just care about playing guitar <laughs> you know what i mean yeah like yeah you're like okay i need a guitar i need a good guitar i need it to sound good i need to play good you know what i mean i want to say no pretentiousness is what i'm trying to get at that's one of the things i like about them i i you know um and it's to me like same thing about mexican strats and tellies right mexican strats tellies and you could say that about prs se too but i think prs se and s2 both get that I think, uh, because to me, uh, it's kind of like when we were talking about the, uh, the highway ones from Fender when they made those, you know, guitars for like, you know, under a thousand dollars made in the USA to me, the S2, some of the S2s are pricey, but man, you can still pick up S2s for a grand. And uh, I have an S2 and I like it just as much as my core PRS and what it does. And I don't like, I don't ever pick it up and I never shamefully say like, Oh, this is the S2. <laughs> I always say like, this is a PRS made in the USA. I like, I love it. It does everything I want. I was so tempted to get the S2 five nine thin line when I when I moved away because I was like, oh, I could buy it at dealer cost right now. Like, you I know, love... use my employee purchase, and the thin line is like, I think is the best PRS that they're making right now, especially for like, I've been getting into doom metal and fuzz tones lately. So when we were building prototypes, I was bringing like just any fuzz pedal that I had lying <laughs> around the house to work and playing them on my lunch breaks and stuff. And that that guitar loves fuzz it adores fuzz pedals i love the 594 s2 i did a video of i had a 594 as you know and then i had and then i got the 594 s2 for the video yeah i worked on that one for sure yeah because I, I actually brought it up to marketing and then they shit and then they sent it to you yeah and uh and i you know i i sold both those but nathan knows why uh i bought the prs hollow body that's behind me um and i bought the pr i sold those to buy the prs hollow body uh because when i did the podcast with um uh, Jack Higginbotham, the COO who runs SE now for PRS. Yeah, you did that podcast the day after I finished the guitar. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, I uh, I did uh, I did that video with him, and um, I talked to him, and what I got a sense after that was, you know, if I wanted to buy a hollow body too, I'd be I'm better off buying it now than later. Yeah, you bought that, and you're like, this is the last PRS I'm ever going to need, and I hadn't shipped out the other one yet, and I yeah. was like, oh. <laughs> Well, I like yours more. Yeah. Um, all right. So Tampa Blues says pronounced at my po blues. Oh, Tampa Blues. What did I say? Tampa Blues. Yeah. I said it right. I think he's just joking around. Oh. I saw that comment earlier. Oh. I think he was just. Can you put? <laughs> can you put? Uh, wait. Can you put on? I don't understand. Can I put on newer fret twenty two? fret fender player series next on an older made mixed because okay. it's a 21 fret right yes uh so so the question is here's the question i, I again i i understand sometimes i have to read them and kind of understand where we're going with this the question so everybody wants 
to understand. Um, can you take, can you order or get one of the new Fender Player Series made in Mexico Strat necks that have 22 frets and stick it on the old made in Mexico 21 fret guitars? Absolutely, they're actually the same neck. They're just different fretboards. So the 22 neck and the 21 or 22 fret neck from Fender Mex made in Mexico and the 21 fret made in Mexico neck are identical in every way except for the fretboard on the 22 neck is longer and it hangs over the pickguard. So that's it. So yes, absolutely you can. It doesn't change scale length. They're both 25 and a half inch scale length. Everything's just plays out great. By the way, I'm, the reason I'm being very specific is because this also would pertain for the American stuff. So if you had a 21 fret American Strat and you wanted to put a 22 fret neck on it, uh, yeah. In fact, so you know, famously, this is why Fender does this because Fender came out obviously later with the 22 fret neck after the 21 fret. And artists are notoriously known back in the 70s and 80s of taking off those 21 fret necks and putting 22 fret necks on there. So yeah, interchanges out perfectly, lines up, you're good to go. Uh, Christopher Standard Time says, been getting into the idea of getting an ovation, but people seem to hate them. Okay. <laughs> They're definitely like, for me, it's like, I put, I always put my cell phone in my pocket to keep it from falling off yeah. my leg, but they didn't have cell phones in the seventies. What did people do back then? Well, okay. So, so, um, <laughs> I know so, they have like that grip tape on the bottom. They like did. That's, yeah. That's yeah. how I always picture yeah, it. Like, uh, I still did it with my cell phone. When I, I had an ovation for a short period of time in my life. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, mine had the rubber foot. They had a, like a, a sticker, like a D, you know, not decal, but a sticker, a rubber yeah, decal yeah. on the side and it grepped your leg. Um, but you could use, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, skateboard deck tape. Yeah. Grip tape. Yeah. Grip tape. Just put that on there and that would do that too. So yeah, you can do that if that's, if that's even an issue for you, it doesn't actually always be an issue for everybody. Um, look, here's, there's going to be a ton of reasons why people like, uh, dislike them. One, they look weird, so people hate that. Uh, I think a lot of hate for the ovations comes from the fact that you got to understand at one point in the world, in the guitar world, ovation was like, it took over, <laughs> right? Yeah. It just became like this thing and everyone had to have one, every rock star. And then it became the staple for that kind of genre of music, right? The the rocker guys really kind of adopted the ovation more so than, but it, keep in mind, not not only just them, I mean, folk players, everybody played them too, but the, the rock guys really took them over. Um, it was like that in the Kramer Farrington. Everybody was using those yeah. two acoustics back in the day. <laughs> On a side note, the Kramer Farrington, you know what? Every time I see one of the new uh, Fender acoustic oh, yeah. i think they found a way to bring back the kramer farrington like this is going to be the thing the the i and so you know i'm not dogging the acoustic sonic okay um and 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 i don't think anyone should if you don't like it don't buy it <laughs> uh uh some i have a couple friends who love them they bought them and they love them uh i have a couple friends that played them and hated them i picked it up and um it was fine it's like the Strat acoustic. Remember those? And like the back yeah. of them felt like right. They like sprayed them with Rhino liner or yeah. something. Uh, it's they're fine, but they definitely remind me of like the. Oh yeah, I remember back when it was like, oh, I'm, I want an acoustic, but I don't want to hold an acoustic. <laughs> I <laughs> and I'm like, I understand that, I guess, right? Uh, but uh, so back to your question. So he's got more to it. He says, uh, he says U.S. custom shop models around, uh, avoid or go for it. Uh, well, the policy on the on the podcast is if you ask if you, should, if you ask if you should buy a guitar, you should. Yes, buy it. Um, helps the economy and uh, perpetuates the craziness of of we all just keep buying guitars. I guess of this industry. Yeah, <laughs> keeps everybody's keeps Nathan working, keeps us all working. Yeah. But no, I like Ovations. Uh, they're cool guitars. Uh, they just are. And so, um, you know, I don't know. There you go. So do it. My friend's dad, this girl I went to high school with, her dad was like crazy into ovations. He, I remember he had like seven, seven of them, and like they would have like ovation get-togethers and stuff, and a bunch of people would play music live. And I remember he would always perform at those. I, I saw videos of him playing, but he was like people that are into ovation are like really into ovations, yes. and you know for good reason. Like they're great playing guitars. Yes. Are they I, still owned by Cordoba? Who's... Uh, I think that's who owns them now. Okay, is Cordoba? I could be wrong. No, I thought Cordoba got uh, Guild. I okay, think, I think you're right. Yeah, yeah. I think I, uh, I mean, Ovation was Command, and then Command got bought by Fender, and then then it got sold off. Yeah, and I don't know who. When they it did now. that, they got rid of a couple acoustic companies yeah. like all at once. Yeah, I remember? 
Um, <laughs> Mike Jones says, you're supposed to play lying down with an ovation. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Harry says, if you have a belly ovation, sit really funny but that, that I find that occurs with a lot of guitars. <laughs> the belly, just the belly carve is, yeah. is, uh, is your friend. If you like to throw back a couple beers, that's for sure. Um, <laughs> okay. So, uh, let's, uh, let me, I'm looking oh, in. Cayman. The... My buddy just messaged me. I think Cayman owns. No, oh, not anymore. No, not anymore. Okay. I thought, I don't think so. It's so it's not Cayman, it's Command. Oh, oh. Okay. Yeah, it's it sounds it looks like Cayman. Okay, K -A -M -A -N. I thought you said Command. Okay. Yeah, it's com that. it's Command. Command is a helicopter parts company, and I think that at one point they owned uh, Napa Auto Parts, and then yeah, they got into the acoustic guitar business with Ovation, and then they picked up Hamer, and they owned Hamer, and then they uh, made brands like GTX and stuff, and then uh, oh, Command GTX. I forgot Command about got that. sold to. Um, I don't know, some U.S. Music Corp, I think. I don't know, something like that. And then Fender acquired it. was like this weird thing. Remember, Fender bought it, and then Fender gets rid of it. And then, but the brands all got parceled out because there was Jens Gens and, and, uh, and, uh, and who was else in that? Tacoma. Was, Tacoma. Takamini. Takamini. There was all kinds of stuff. No, not yeah. Takamini. Um, but that was distributing. But yeah, yeah. Distributing. Yeah. So I just don't know who ended up with them. Uh, I know Guild. I think, like I said, Cordoba picked up Guild. By the way, my buddy that messaged me about that also said that a five and a half pound uh, five nine four was passed through his bench today. He's he works at my buddy also oh, wow. works at PRS and he's like you missed out on a five and a half pound five nine four and I was like Ugh. I'm thinking right now in my mind like that would have been awesome. Yes, that's <laughs> super light. Um, okay, so he's the one that did the fret work actually on the um, oh on my guitar. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Austin. Tell him thank you. I again. His dad actually messaged him. His dad saw the video without Austin sending it to him or anything. And I'm, his dad messaged him like, you worked on this guitar for Phil McKnight? Like, see, now Austin's a celebrity too. Yes. He's, he, he is. They, uh, He's probably the best fret leveler I know. And I know Phil McKnight. <laughs> see? I love, that's a compliment right there for both of us. <laughs> Um, okay, so next question. We're going to get through some of these. Brad Guitar Miller. Hey, what's up, Brad? He says, never heard from winner Gretsch Zepp for Fret Rocker. Yeah, it's because I didn't send it to you. They did send me an address. That I didn't do. That's that's on me. Um, that Gretsch stuff Zeppelin. takes like a week for me to get to. <laughs> you know what's funny is when I was doing that, I was probably not supposed to be texting and driving, but I was literally driving to the Kiesel factory uh, during that live stream. It's... It's yes, it's that's why I said this process is always slow. <laughs> I, I think I, all I, I think on that one, all I have to do is forward you the email, right? So I'll forward it to you tonight when I do the time stamping. Uh, Mark says, I'm so excited to finally be here on a live show. Me too. I'm excited you're here too. Welcome, Mark. Nathan's excited too. Any plans to review, break down any of the newer Fender, Venture, Offsets, Jaguar, Jazzmas, etc.? Uh, nope. Uh, again, that would have to be through you guys. In other words, if you guys rec recommend it to me that you want me to review that stuff like you just did right now and the patrons do that, you know what I mean? I take all that. And when I start seeing that brand or that product coming up too many times or too many times I'll asked, I, uh, I'll, I'll purchase one and we'll do a video, but, uh, Fender doesn't currently send out any product to the channel. So, um, Tim says, is neck relief a personal preference or is there an ideal measurement that should be uh, trying to get? Uh, I can see a wee bit of relief now on my Epiphone SG. I'm wondering if I should loosen it more. Uh, the answer for me to you is yes, it is a preference, although there is a certain amount of relief you need. You know what I mean? Um, and when I say preference and is, is this... Obviously, if your neck has too much relief, there's issues. And if it doesn't have any relief and it's, it's back bowed, there's problems. But some players are more in tune with problems like buzzing. You know what I mean? Some players don't care. Um, I used to, when I started setting up guitars, what I would do is I kind of start as like a standard, like, here's how you do it. And then I learned real fast. Like that took no time at all. Like not even weeks, just days to figure out. No, 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 no. The, 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 each guitar player has its own, uh, has their own way of how they like the neck to feel. Um, I actually like a little bit of relief in my neck. I don't like it when the neck's too straight. 
In fact, even if a neck can lay perfectly straight and there's no buzzing whatsoever, it doesn't feel right to me. I'm just so used to having just a little bit of that, you know, going upward, uh, you know, momentum, I guess, uh, above the third fret. So uh, that's the answer to your question. Okay. Uh, so if you see some relief, don't worry about it. Uh, I said it in my uh, in my L7 video. I think uh, you know when you use fret rockers, you use all these tools. It's important to use these things. It's important to understand how how guitars are set up. But ultimately, if it feels good, don't doubt yourself. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, that the reason I say that is because that's another thing you get to pick up when you do repairs. Um, there are of course picky customers. Hey, nothing nothing wrong with that. They pay the bills too. Um, they come in and they got a very specific thing they want, and you're going to have to do it. However, there are some uh, customers for repair, and let me give you an example. You, you might fall into this category with this kind of question, where you're like, I like the way the guitar plays, but my friend said that it doesn't play right, and it should be like this. And then I will adjust the guitar to what maybe the specifications should be, and then when you get it, you're like, yeah, I don't like it as much now. And that's the whole point. And I always kind of reiter reiterate that to people. Uh, if you like the way something plays, and, and, and the best example I have of this to always say is there's a video of John Mayer explaining that his black strat, the beat up black strat, the one that you saw him play probably the most, more than probably any guitar to this day, that neck's twisted. He explains that, that they replaced the, they did, I think he said a dozen different necks on it because that neck has a twist in it. And he just likes the way that neck is. So now he's got a guitar that's twisted neck. And I laugh about that because there are players that pick up a neck with a slight twist and they're like, this is unplayable. <laughs> and I'm like, eh. or you can write hit, grammy winning songs with it make a billion dollars <laughs> you know it depends on the person right so so obviously um uh the, my favorite two guitars to mention is that guitar which has got a twisted neck and of course frankenstein which is the eddie van halen guitar uh which is not intonated correctly <laughs> <laughs> that guitar is not intonated correctly that has been documented and proven that because of the way eddie installed the bridge and everything happened the guitar is not correctly intonated but yet it wrote hit songs <laughs> so you have to, you have to kind of, you know. Kind of reminds me of Harpo Marx, you know, from the Marx Brothers. Right. Harpo Marx, his big thing, he's played the harp, but he learned on a out of tune harp, so he can't play like a normal harp. He can only play like his out of tune one and make it sound correct. Just right. Kind of interesting. I remember a few years ago, like back when I first started at BRS. Um, do you remember the Private Sox seven string that uh, Eric Riley's brother had? Um, yes. With the rosewood neck. Yep. So that belonged to this other guy named Eric down in Tucson, and he sent that ne that guitar in to basically get like completely redone. Like it had some chips and you know dings and stuff. So he got the whole thing redone. Well, that's a rosewood neck that had been played for like I don't know five or six years at that point. So it felt a certain way. So when you refresh it, here's a new neck, and it gets sent back out to him. He didn't like it because it didn't play the same yeah. way. And it's like I remember we were kind of joking, like, well, yeah, it's been worn physically worn on raw wood for the past, you know, however many years, like I could slather my hands up in bacon grease and play it for a couple of days and see if that helps. But like, other than that, like you asked for a brand new refreshed version. This is what a brand new guitar I just feels had, like. I just had that happened. Uh, you saw it, that Squire downstairs, mm -hmm. that fretboard had dents, it got dented. Mm -hmm. And so I had to sand it. You know what I mean? Because you could yeah, yeah, yeah. there, there were there were cut lines that couldn't steam out. We steamed out some of it. Had to end up sanding it. No big deal. But the guitar is like I don't know, eighteen years old. Yeah. And from playing, from somebody playing it, all the hand oil and stuff had kind of glossed that fretboard. It felt really great. And yeah. now it feels all raw Insert. and fresh. Did you do the and it doesn't feel or? as good. It lost some of the mojo. Did you do the whole neck or just individual I had to spots? do the whole neck. Yeah, yeah. Because so. it was because there was so much, uh, you know hand juice on it <laughs> yeah, yeah i know right? exactly so much oil yeah. from the hands and residue yeah, and dead polished. skin yeah. and stuff like dead that. skin yeah. and all that stuff it had it all come off and and it's kind of made me sad because it it's like it had to get done and i did it but of course when i was done i was like it's going to take at least another two decades to get it back to where it was just yesterday yeah um you know but that's you know that's the thing about sometimes when that's you the try thing just, you could try buffing the fretboard see if that works you know i usually it's funny that you say that. I I buff my all my fretboards. I actually buff them. Oh yeah. Yeah. I I don't like a, uh the fretboards and they're raw. I'll take a buffer to anything I can. Yeah. I mean, I I buffed the fretboard on the guitar I did for you, and if you look at it in between the other two PRSs you have, there's a huge difference between that fretboard and the other two, and that's because I took a light grit buffing wheel and buffed the crap out of it to get 
to get it that shiny and that kind of glossed over look. The first time I saw that was, I think it was Fender, when Fender went from the standard to the professional, they said they were buffing the fretboards. And I was like, the Rosewood fretboards. And I was like, what, what, whatever. I might have it backwards. They may have been doing it before and they stopped. I can't remember which one's which. Mm -hmm. But I remember, the, all that matters is this. I picked up a fretboard, a, a Strat one day that had a buff fretboard because they were kind of was in the literature of why it's so great. And I was like, buff the Rosewood fretboard? What the hell for? Right? right? Yeah, yeah. And then I played it. And I'm like, oh, and this has got to be the thing in my life from now on. Mm -hmm. uh, it says, uh, Matt's uh, questions. Oh. No, Matt's question, we're, we're on the right question. Matt says, uh, thank you. Uh, you saved me a lot of money by showing us how to work on guitars at home. I just got an American Pro 2 in the Dark Knight, which is the the, the cool the color. Black. Yeah, I yeah. love it. Uh, being a lefty, it's a nice guitar, the nicest guitar I've ever played. Uh, I'm a Fender guy. I love that finish because I wanted a Fender Pro Strat uh, back in the 90s, and that was a color that was reminiscent to that color then. Uh, Caster... Caster Rivera. It was here's the deal. I, I it's funny that I was just telling a friend about this this week. I was saying, uh, you know, sometimes you know when companies send stuff out to YouTube channels, you know, this, sometimes they'll send you something and you you do a video with it and they send it to other channels. I, I when they came out with those guitars and those colors, uh, it was like literally they sent like fifty out to YouTube channels, and uh, I'm not in there like they're. Uh, I'm not in Fender's roster. They're not sending anything out. And uh, <laughs> like I said, they used to send stuff. And then I don't know if this is the case. I just, uh, maybe I should reach out and ask them again. I, I am. How come I'm not on the list, bro? No, not that. It's just they were sending stuff. And then, like I said, I started taking guitars apart. Like I said, I took the, the new player series. They sent it to me. I took oh, it apart and compared it to the. I remember that. And I've learned. And again, I don't want to say that's the reason why. I've just learned from the years of doing videos where companies send stuff, if you start taking stuff apart and looking at it and comparing stuff, you tend to get off the roster real fast. They're not looking for that video. They want you just to show the product or demo it or talk about it. They really don't want you to break it down. I, I could be wrong, but it always seems to happen that way. But anyways, my point is when that color came out and I saw everybody get that color, I was like, oh, that's amazing. I'm like, of course. And then you question your, your question, you're like, maybe I shouldn't take things apart and talk about it. <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, that's right. Trogley's like whole show. That's what he does. Yeah. It's, it's a great you, show. You know what it is? You have to, well, in that video, what happened was when the player came out, I wanted to know why they raised the price. What was different? What did they change? You know what I mean? What was comparatively uh, different to the you know to the new model to the old model? Um, so it was just important for me. Uh, yeah. To me, to, it was for important for me. I wanted to know, and I figured people wanted to know. Yeah, and you make content that you like. It. So yeah, it and that's sense. exactly it. Perfectly said. I make content that I I like, um, and then hopefully somebody else likes it too. <laughs> Caster uh, Caster says I have a '90s Les Paul and the headstock top finish is flaking off like dry skin. Suggestions? He has a what? What kind? I missed it. He's got a 1990s Les Paul, so it's Ooh. a. It's oh a, yeah, yes. I I did read that comment earlier. The headstock, yeah. I mean that's night that's nitro. It'll if it's not done correctly and it'll flake off the top. I don't know if that is that that sounds like it's probably way out of warranty at this point. Yeah. But your best bet would be to try and stick some super glue underneath it and. If you don't know what you're doing, I wouldn't recommend it at all. So yeah, take it I in. would just let it, let it go. Like it's at this point, if you're not a professional, then anything that I suggest is going to be kind of hard to do. Yeah. So, I mean, short of just stripping the headstock and respraying it with nitro, then yeah, that's, I, I, I'd probably have to leave it or call Gibson. Like a, a lot of times in finish repair, since I'm factory trained, you know, whatever that means. Um, my instinct is to know that I, you know, what I can do, what, what I can get away with. But if I mess it up, the guitar can go right back into the spray room and get resprayed. They could just redo it, but that's not an option that everybody else has. So I don't want somebody to attempt this and now their guitar is, you know, unsalvageable by, yes. by a hobbyist standards. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and... um, so oh. Yeah, my recommendation would be you can try to stick a little super glue underneath it to keep it from spreading more, but definitely call Gibson first before touching it and see what they have to say about it. Because it sounds like it's nitro if it's a 90s Gibson. Well, I mean, all USA Gibsons pretty much are, are lacquer or nitro. Um, so, yeah, those would be my couple suggestions. 
And the important takeaway from that caster also is if you're listening to him is it's not, it's going to get worse because yeah. as it flakes off, it's just going to keep flaking off. So you got to stop it. If you don't want it to keep flaking off, you're going to have to take it to have it either refinished, you know, put a new fit, whatever, or like you said, get glue underneath there to stop it from peeling or, you know, being bumped and peeled and, you know, cracking off and lifting. Um, either way, here's what I will tell you. Um, when it, So here's, and again, you know, he's the guy to ask for finished work, but when it comes to repairs like cracks, finish issues, you know, anything that gets worse progressively over time, the only advice I can give anybody is this. It only gets more expensive to repair and it can only get, and it can only get worse in the idea that it will look worse when they repair it. So when you have repairs like that, do it as fast as you can. Cause it's, it's a guy, like I said, every day, every month, every, you know what I mean? Every time you do it, it's going to get worse or it's going to get more expensive. So certain things like that, same thing with acoustics, with cracks, you know, you see a Oof. crack when you least, yeah, you see finished cracks, you see stuff. If you're going to have that finish, uh, if you're gonna have that fixed, do it as fast as possible. Cause like I said, it, it, it not obviously it doesn't get better, but more importantly, it does not only get worse, but it gets more expensive. Cause you know what I mean? The, the harder it is to do more, you know, more of that stuff. Uh, Jimmy T five, six, eight says, I'm a 30 year old. Uh, I assume it's 30 year old. He's a 30 year luther, luthier. So he might be a 30 year luthier, luthier for 30 years. Just recently opened my own shop shop. Congratulations, by the way, Jimmy. Awesome. Says for Nathan, what is your choice of final coat, nitro, acrylic, lacquer, 2k, urethane, or oils? Ooh, that's a big, tough one. Uh, for me, I don't like nitro over time cause I don't like checking just if i buy a guitar i kind of want it to look the same like the way that i bought it um urethane will look less yellow over um like white guitars uh the good the finish that i've worked with the most so most hands-on time has been 2k acrylic so given my background of fixing it and repairing it and stuff i'd probably say 2k is is my favorite and i like the way that it feels um so then, I don't hold on. I'm yeah, interrupting you, but I want to be clear. So I think you should break it into two things: your favorite favorite to work with, and your favorite for its result. Okay, so favorite for result, I'd probably say 2K. I really like the way that it looks uh, when it's all done, and you can get it super shiny. It's pretty durable. That it's a good mix of durable where it doesn't crack after getting hit, as opposed to. Uh, it cracks less than uh, something like a polyester, which will just completely chip. You know, you'll get these big chunks taken out and stuff. Um, urethane is my favorite for white because of the way that it doesn't kind of change the color of the white. But the easiest to work on is actually nitro because it's so easy to sand uh, when you're doing finish work and finish repair. Right. Um, nitro is the easiest because you could use higher grit sandpapers and take off less material and still get the work done that you need to and use really really thin glues and stuff so i guess for final result 2k is my favorite uh just because of the way that it looks and the way that it feels on my hand i i like it the uh the next question is for blake from blake it's not for blake it's from blake he wants to know he's got a, a 1990s made mexico strat with pay oh no he wants to refinish his 1990 made mexico strat with paint huffer sparkle that's because it's awesome. Shout out uh, to Paint Huffer. It, local. Yeah, local. Uh, my Paint Huffer Sparkle guitar is... Can you see it? How do I show you guys? <laughs> I can see it. <laughs> oh, look. I can do this. Watch this. Uh, give me a second. <laughs> this is funny for the audio. People are like, what? What? Look, I can do that. No, that's not what I meant to do. <laughs> Maybe I could do nothing. Don't go back to us. I thought, I thought there was... Oh, right here. Look at this. Man, Paint Huffer has those There it is, glasses. and it's still out of shot. It's over <laughs> there. I was trying to show you guys the the Paint Huffer guitar. All right, so anyways, I have a beautiful Paint Huffer uh, sparkle that Brian and the guys at Paint Huffer did for me. Um, so I basically says he wants to do that. What's the best way to go? He he wants to know how to remove his paint, I think. He says, uh, to what's the best way to grow? Heat gun, scrape? If it's uh, nitro, you can probably do that because the nitro will come off pretty easily under... under a heat gun. Um, what I can't tell you know what? Let me do this. Just to make life easy for everyone. I mean, if you're doing it in sparkle, Ooh. you don't need to. Okay, so here's what I will tell you, Blake. This is the guitar. Now, Paint Huffer, as you know, makes paint. They don't paint. 
guitars uh, for the most part. So this is the Paint Huffer paint on this guitar on the Charvel. This was painted by Joe. It's hard uh, to see that burst, but that burst I is know, the, I know, and that sucked. That's the thing about this guitar. So you guys know, Nathan's talking about, this is actually blue burst. It's a lighter blue in the center, and it dark, goes to dark on the edges. Um, and this is uh, essentially a, um, a polyurethane. And I think it came out great, and I think it, it really pops. So the reason I tell you that is, uh, so, uh, Blake, here's what I can tell you with Paint Huffer experience. I have actually uh, got to see a guitar within the last year that uh, somebody used Paint Huffer Flake, and they did nitro. And I, and of course, Joe painted this with poly with the, the Paint Huffer Flake. And here's what I can tell you. The nitro one I saw had already started yellowing. And the the paint huffer the, the magic of the paint huffer flake is is Brian explained to me that they everybody thinks to go big flake, right? But it's all about smaller flakes because they have more reflective surfaces, right? And so it, it's like diamonds when you see their stuff, right? Um, and I think if you use lacquer, in my personal opinion, you're you're dulling. You know what I mean? You want the finish to be as bright as possible. If you want that stuff to sparkle. Literally, you could blind people with those flakes that Paint Huffer makes. It's, yeah. it's freaking amazing. So I would go poly with it, um, just because if you if if your if your instinct is to let that Paint Huffer flake really pop, that's what they do great. Ryan from Sixty Cycle Hum says he likes your sparkle. Oh, thanks, Ryan. One more time, just for you. And. He also I, said hashtag hand juice earlier when we were talking oh, about hand the prep juice. hashtag hand I, juice. Thanks, thanks, Ryan. I appreciate that. Um, the uh, the funny thing I want to just show you, you can see that it's got the Know Your Gear logo underneath the finish. That's also flake too. And then they put the other logo on the back. This guitar was a funny guitar. Um, when uh, when we did the uh, great guitar build off, Joe and Brian were like, "Hey, we'd like to do a guitar for you." I had a black Charvel, and I said, "Sure." And they go, "What do you want me to do?" What? What? what do, they said, "Well, do whatever you want, Phil. What do you want to do?" And I said, "I want to do whatever you want to do." <laughs> I said, "Just do whatever you want." I'll, and they go, "And they go anything?" And I go, I, "Whatever you want." I, and uh, so they made this two tone blue, and they put my logos in the front and back, which is really cool, right? I, and that's what I was hoping for. They would do something. That I would never do. I would never put the, logo, the logos on it. Um, uh, I didn't think to do that actually, and now I think it's cool because uh, here's why: uh, that guitar is never going anywhere. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like when they put, you know, put your name on it, so to speak. So Zim says, "I glitter every old BC rich I can get." <laughs> Glitter's cool, cool man. Yeah. It's just, it's great. Um, James F says guitar. Oh, this is the guitar center question. We already did this one. Uh, we have ice pick 19 says, Hey, Phil, thanks to you. Stu Mac is out. Wait. Oh, out of fret and dress files forever. Can you recommend another one? Yeah. I was it's, just about to buy one. And I noticed they were out too. It's not my fault. That's not, maybe it is a little bit. <laughs> uh, uh, okay. So here's, here's good news. Let me give you some good news. Uh, it says, uh, he just want to say also he got a new guitar day. He got a uh, revolta, uh, can, Cabanita. Oh, sweet. Today. Okay, so here's some good news for you at uh, those that may, like Ice Pick, want a Fred and Dress file from Stu Mac. Uh, I don't know if I told you this, but I'm, uh, uh, I'm, uh, Stu Mac asked if I wanted to do a co uh, venture with them, a giveaway with them on my Instagram. Uh, those of you who follow me on Instagram know I really put little effort into it because I hate <laughs> Instagram and Facebook. I use it like most people as much as I can tolerate. Um, it's just my personal thing. I just, you know what I mean? It's, uh, I'm not really into like, look at me. Uh, it's a, uh, so anyways, my point, what's my point? My point is, is that, um, Stumac, this is the question they asked me. They said, Hey, would you do a, a co co thing with us? I don't know what you call that. Like a co thing, uh, where we, uh, give away some stuff. And the girl I was talking to, uh, which I shouldn't call her girl, I'm sorry. The woman I was talking to at Stu Mac, who was very nice, uh, is amazing, by the way. She came up with an idea. She goes, you did this video with your tool, t t your tackle box, and you called it the ultimate restring tackle box. We would like to recreate that and give it away. By the way, this is why this is important. I've been I waiting for them to do that. <laughs> I didn't know this. This is how crazy this is. I didn't know this, but... It's a thousand dollars worth of stuff in that tackle box when I did that video. So she she got back to me and she goes, I, and, and so you know, a lot of that stuff in there, it's not even Stumac. Stumac bought the stuff that they don't carry. 
She goes, we're going to give away that whole tackle box to one of your uh, followers on Instagram. And I said, okay. And so I said, she's like, are you interested? And I go, yeah. I mean, what do I have to do? And she's like, you have to tell your viewers. And then if they follow you on Instagram, I think you have to follow me on Instagram and Stu Mac. Yeah. It's like tag a friend in the yeah, comments. Yeah. You tag follow a friend in the comments. We'll explain yeah. it all when it happens. Here's the thing, man. All that matters is this. I, I'm not getting paid. I don't get anything out of the deal, but I also don't have to do anything. They're going to, they're going to make the tackle box a thousand dollars worth of tools and give it away to somebody. All I got to do is tell you guys when it happens. However, the reason I'm telling you that story now is because it's happening next month in May because they're waiting for to be supplied up. So if you're interested in those tools, like the the the, the uh, uh, fret dress file and stuff, I have a feeling they're getting them by the end of the month because that's when they want to launch this campaign. Have you used the uh, three corner file? Austin knows, always says that he loves. I haven't used it. Yet. He likes that. He prefers that one over the fret and oh, dress. Oh no no file. no! You're talking about the three corner file. I'm thinking yeah, about yeah. their new uh, crowning file. No, no. I have the three corner file downstairs as well. I have all the files, <laughs> all of the files. I bought all of them over the years. Do you keep years. them in a filing cabinet? Huh? I have them in a filing cabinet. <laughs> I like, in fact, when you see, anytime you see my back, that wall backdrop, there's all those green, orange, green, all those orange files in a row down the wall. That's yeah. all the files. Yeah. Um, I, I use them all for purpose, certain purposes, but I like the front and dress as well. But uh, anyways, so Ice Pick, don't worry. They'll be back in stock by the end of the month. It looks like, and then I'll make, and of course you guys, I'll be making the announcements when the giveaway happens and stuff. So you guys can win that thousand dollars worth of tools, man. My uh, buddy Joe from PRS just dropped in. He went to school here out in Roberto Van and then got a job at PRS. Oh, at PRS? Yeah. So you just shouting out real quick. I want to shout out my buddy Joe, even though when we play Super Smash Brothers, he sucks. <laughs> so I just want to put that out there real quick. So your shout it is <laughs> that he sucks. Yeah. His Falco is trash. He knows what it means. <laughs> All right. Vite DT says, hey, Phil, I have a Fender Pawn Shop Greta amp, okay, which I like awesome. a lot. What are your thoughts on an experience with the Pawn Shop series? Um, well, I did this uh, video where I made fun of the Pawn Shop amps because uh, they didn't say Fender on them. That's my own yeah, critique. Yeah, it's like Excelsior and Vaporizer yeah, the Excelsior, and all that other stuff. Um, the, the Rampart. Yeah, I like all those amps, by the way. I, I, I think I was clear in the video. I hope I was. I love all the amps. I just thought it was weird that Fender didn't put their logo on it. And a lot of people in the comments were like, well, you don't understand, Phil, what they're after. I'm like, no, you don't understand what they're after. When that pawn shop series of, of amps came out, what happened was when when Fender, when Bill Schultz passed away, uh, which uh, he was the CEO of, of Fender, who, who who's the one who, who took Fender from CVS, you know, back to uh, its in current invest, well, the investors and the employees and stuff. He passed away. They had to get a new uh, CEO. They got Larry uh from he was guitar center ceo and he took over and you know now it's andy and when larry uh became ceo of fender he put a lot of the guitar center ology into fender which is you need new stuff all the time to Flash. keep people yeah you got to keep people buying and how you keep people buying is new crap guitar center is all about like new new items new items new items every time you walk in the store there's something new for you to buy so all of a sudden fender had these mandates like we need 50 new accessories. We need a new new guitar every month. We need a new amp every month. And the the guys in the R&D and, and 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 product development at Fender were just dying, man. You could see it uh, interacting with them. They were just like constantly like, "Okay, here's a new strat, here's a new color, here's a new thing." And they were just keep making new products to the point where they couldn't even make new Fender products. They started making like the Pine Shop series, the these are Fender products that aren't Fender products. Right? Yeah, the, I remember the commercials for those were so the they were like done like weird fifties yeah, like infomercial it, kind of. So the the yeah. products are great. I like the pawn shop gar guitars. I like the pawn shop amps. Uh, uh, that's easy. Okay, I like the stuff. I just remember what was going on at that time, which was Fender was just adopting new product after new product after new product uh, to 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 get those numbers. And I think at that time the big play was they were trying to go public. They were trying to do a public offering. So I think they were trying to show like a lot of excitement and a lot of stuff. And then that got tamed down real fast. That didn't last very long. That was a couple years short lived. Of... I think around that same time though, they did some strats that we ended up liking. Cause like oh, the longboard strat well, came out, that thinner mahogany they, body strat came out. That was some cool stuff. That's a great stuff. Yeah. Um, it's just, so, you know, for, for me at the time we were dealer, it was fatiguing constantly ordering this stuff to have it in your store. You know what I mean? And constantly like, it's just, you got to have the new thing that's this month. It's all about, and that's how they did it to you. They came to you as a dealer and they're like, oh, you don't want people to walk in your store and not have the new Greta amp. And you're like, 
uh, yeah, I don't want that to happen. <laughs> I think we ended up discounting the vaporizer and the uh, the yeah, Excelsior amps. The Excelsior, no, the Excelsiors did great. The Greta did great because they didn't make as many of them, and the vaporizer, I think, was the slow burn. It depends. It was huge. That amp was huge. huge. It had the foot switch. All it did was like turn all the knobs to ten. That's what but, it sounded like. But, but those are cool weird. amps. I bet you. I haven't looked. I imagine they got to be worth something now. Like not a lot, but I mean they're holding value. I would imagine because yeah. they were different and cool. And came so, with cool colors. I remember that. Like yeah. seafoam green with seafoam the gray. Seafoam green. The, the Daphne yeah. blue. The red, uh, the, the cardinal. Red. Was it cardinal red, I think? I can't remember what the name of that red Yeah, was. I don't remember the name of the red. I just remember it was red. J.R. Baker says, best way to remove pick scratches on clear coat of an Epiphone. Mm, just some light buffing compound and a shop rack. If it's just pick scratches, as there. long as they're not super deep. There yeah. you go. Um, yeah, I use the same thing. I use, uh, what I use is, uh, you can use, obviously, anything McGuire's is great. Um uh, like I said, I've done it in a bunch of videos. I have this uh, pick scratch swirl remover from Stu Mac, and I've said this a thousand times. I'll say it a thousand times more. I literally use it because I bought it in like 2007. Yeah, it lasts forever, and, <laughs> and you don't it, need a ton of it. And it's still half full, and I I'm constantly using it. You know, every month, uh, you just don't. You know, you put a little dab, um, and I use a Meguiar's little buffing pad. You, you ever use those, Nathan? Those little, like a little. Not, like not a, from McGuire, no. Yeah, I just use a, but you know, like you said, you can use a shop rack. Um, elbow grease, just do it, man. Um, Lizard spit makes some good stuff too. Yeah, of course, lizard spit. Uh, I, I have, you know, I use all that stuff too. Um, David's uh, question says, Phil, sell me on PRS over Kiesel. Mm. Okay, hold on a second. It's tough. Uh, only adversions to PRS are that they're super chunky necks. Played the S2 Semi Hollow and loved it, just not the neck. Sure. Well, then here's your problem, buddy. You have to. You have two choices. If you don't like, look, nothing can sell you on a guitar if you don't like the neck. Nothing. It could be the best looking guitar. It could have the sweetest tone. It could be right. It could be a, a miracle. I don't know what. Whatever you want to say. The neck is a hundred percent. The thing that if you can't get around, if you don't like that, it's never going to come. Uh, it's never gonna. It's never gonna come around. So, uh, that being said, if you don't like the chunky, uh, wide pattern, regular necks, whatever the S2 neck. Yeah, yeah, pattern regular. You have to do one of two things. You have to find used or pony up and get yourself a pattern thin or uh, what pattern regular. No, pattern thin, right? Yeah, pattern. Pattern thin, thin or wide thin neck if you're older models which will be everything from, and the old models, custom 22s had them sometimes, you know, again, you have to find the ones that say that my Mira has a pattern thin, uh, neck. Uh, the, uh, custom 24 core has a pattern thin neck. The S E guitar custom 24. You have to look at each S E is different. Some of them have the pattern regular. Some of them have the pattern thin. I think the S E's are still wide thin. They're not wide. Thin. Yeah. Well, yeah. So I was going to just so perfectly said, cause I was going to just tell you this, the SEs that have the thin neck have a thinner neck than the American models. Yeah. They're even smaller. So if you like small necks, there's nothing smaller that PRS makes than the wide thin SE neck. Yeah. There's only one USA S2 with a thin neck and that's the 594 thin line is the only S2 with, I mean, if you don't put CE into that category, cause yeah. CE is its own thing. Yep. The CE is a pattern thin and then the 594 only the thin line the s2 not the normal not the s2 um 594 custom the maple top one just the all mahogany one that one has a thinner neck profile yep and so that's what i'm so that's the easy part for you you just got to find those necks and they're out there yeah uh you find them used or like i said they have new models they have they've really dominated over the last decade the pattern regular the thicker neck it's really dominating all the models yeah um but there's a lot of options out there in older models. Uh, you just have to look. Yeah. And Custom 24s, you can still get a choice. If you order a core, you can get the choice between. The only thing I will caution you on, as someone who's bought a lot of PRSs over the years, uh, try to find ones with the hang tags that say, because the hang tags will say what neck it is. So try to find a guitar. If it's used or new, it doesn't matter. You need the hang tag. It'll say on there what neck it is. Do not, do not, <laughs> do, do not, one more time, do not believe anyone on reverb or ebay or craigslist whatever Feels like a fender yeah whatever yeah. they're saying to you here's how you do it man 
You just have them measure the neck. I, every reviewer you got them, I do. I take the caliper out and I measure the first fret and the 12th fret. You have them measure their first fret and the 12th fret. The dimensions will tell you, right? You can look them up, uh, which one, you know, which pattern then and which pattern. I don't know off reference what, you know, off the top of my head, what numbers they are, but my videos have them. So just watch the videos. Um, here's why. I, it happens all the time. <laughs> all the time uh somebody will bring in a guitar for setup and they're like hey phil I, I, this guitar this prs I, I, can you set it up it just i'm playing it hurts my hand and i'm like and they're like oh i like the thin neck but this this is the thin neck and then i'll check the neck and i go no this is the, the this is the, the wide fat yeah and they're like no 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 the guy was like it's a it's a white thin well the guy was wrong because like you measure the first fret and the 12th fret and it tells you um, you could also look at the mod cat. If the person selling it's brave enough to just pick up the bridge pickup and take a picture of the, uh, of the like barcode sticker that's on there, you can throw those numbers. It'll, you, if it's a custom, it'll start with like CU and then a number, uh, you can throw those into a mod cat decoder and it'll tell you, uh, what neck profile it has. See, the only thing it won't tell you is I think the mod cat, the only mod cat decoder online only, only goes up to like 2013. So pattern vintage is not in there yet. And the John Mayer net carves are not in there yet. And then I guess probably the if the Fiore, which got which came out after I stopped working at PRS, I don't think that net carve was in it. Yeah. So so that's what I would say. Do that. Um, as for the Kiesel versus PRS thing, like I said, it's a it's a it's a it's a moot point, so to speak, in the idea that it doesn't matter which one I like or don't like more than each other. It's all about the necks. Yeah. If you if you if you. Uh, so that's what I would try for the PRS. And then of course the Kiesel's easier in the concept of, yeah, the Kiesel standard neck that Kiesel makes, they have an option where you can get it thinner. I don't own any Kiesel's with a thinner neck. I don't even think I've actually put my hand on the thinner neck Kiesel, not a Kiesel branded one, maybe the carbon necks, but I like the standard neck. I don't get the thicker one. I don't get the thinner one. I just get the standard Kiesel neck. And if you um, talk to the sale, the two main sales guys that I know over, over at Kiesel are, are Chris Hong and then Flock. Yep. Both of those guys are experienced enough. Ask them yeah. like, hey, I don't like the PRS uh, yep. pattern regular neck. Can you compare it to that neck specifically? And both of those guys have played PRSs, so they know. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I have both necks on my PRS. I have the pattern regular and the pattern thin. And uh, there's things I like and don't like about each one. I used to just be one way about the necks. And then over years, I kind of... You know, I, I don't know. It, I'm in a, I get in a mood, just like what I was talking about earlier on on this podcast about the amps. I get in a mood and I just want to play that amp. Same thing with necks. Sometimes I, I just want a thick neck. Sometimes I want a thinner neck. It just depends on my mood and what I'm playing. Um, Telly Driver says, Phil, thanks for your mention of the holy board. I just got one for the mo uh, for a mobile one for playing uh, out on my deck. I love my holy board. I still look. <laughs> This is my first holy board right here. It's even discolored. You can I don't know if the discolorment will come in. This is the uh, I still oh yeah, see it's all Yeah, if you watch the really old videos stained. from you. Yeah, this is my this is I love my holy boards. Still my favorite boards. I um, gave mine to Austin when I moved because I couldn't fit it in the truck. <laughs> you no know, I, I, I just want to tell you again, uh, you know, that's one thing that's cool about having the podcast. I get to talk about stuff, you know, that happens. Uh, the Holy Board guy, Chris, the owner of Holy Boards, he makes those in the U.S. He's a cool dude. He's always been nice to me. Like I said, I bought my first couple Holy Boards. The first two I bought, I did videos. He saw the videos, and he's like, hey, can I send you the new one? We sent the new one out. I did a video of that. I really liked them. Um, I just want to tell you what, how, why I told you about people and products. I love Holy Boards. I love the products. But then the people, too. It's when you meet great people. He's a guy that basically, he, he was like, hey, what? I did the videos and the videos I guess did well. And I don't know. I don't think, I think he felt like he didn't compensate me enough or take care of me enough. I'm not sure. I'm speculating by the way. What I, reason why I'm telling you this is, is this, uh, you know, I did a video. I wholeheartedly told you guys what I thought. I love the product. It's literally what I use. This is different than a review for me than on Holy Board. It's what I use. So it's not about what I think about it. It doesn't matter what I think about it. It's what I use all the time. Um, what's funny is, he, he, I don't know, like months ago, just became a patron, <laughs> right? He just bought a pat a month, a year's worth of patron for me. The five, I think five dollar, ten dollar, I don't know which one, but he did a patron. I saw it because I saw, you know, I saw his name, and I go, hey, that's weird. The same name as this guy who owns Holy Board, and then I saw that it is Holy Board, and that's really cool because, again, you know what I mean? 
he didn't have to do that. I already did the video. He's getting nothing out of this now. I mean, obviously we're talking about it now, but we're talking about it because someone someone super chatted talking about holy boards. See, so I just want to let you know that's that's the kind of people you love to find in this industry. Here's somebody that basically is like, hey, I'll send you out the board. I do the video, and and then he's he wants to support what I do here. I appreciate that. So it makes it really fun when it's those kind of you know people and the product are cool. He's working with uh, Jack White. They're doing. Yeah, I know. I saw the That's yellow, so cool. yellow uh, holy board. It looks cool as hell. Yeah, I kind of want one because the yellow. Is... Yeah, me too. Black and yellow is yeah. kind of my thing. I don't, it's just a funny. I, it's the same thing. I'm like, I just want it because the colors. Um, Michael says tips. If you want to paint, oh, we did this one, did it? Yeah, yeah, we did this one. And then I think we're almost done. Here we are. We have day talk. Day talk uh, says I'll be picking up a Les Paul Classic later this month, and I wanted to know. How the 61 pickups stack up against the 57s. Uh, Phil's PRS is super sick. Nate. So we're saying, <laughs> of course. Yes. Thank you. That was is. a big, I, I got to say it every time. That was a big group effort. I did like, other than organizing it, I did the least amount of work on that guitar. Everybody else did all the really cool stuff. That guitar is cool as hell for a ton of reasons, obviously, if you've seen the video. But one of the cool things that's cool about it is it, everyone thinks it's a private stock. <laughs> And that was my goal. Yeah. And it's just cool to say, you know, like, oh, in fact, I just started telling people it is. Like, <laughs> just say, yeah, it's a private stock. Yeah. I just whatever. say it's a private stock because it looks like a private stock. I don't think you can do that on a private stock. See? Like the stuff that I did to it, I probably, I took so many liberties with that guitar that, uh, like that, that I got, I, I got the idea for the neck being satin and the body being gloss from your framus. Cause I was going to do the top gloss like that and do the back of the body uh, satin, but because of the finger carve and there's not really many flat edges, it wasn't really going to work out that well. Plus when I gave it to base coat, they grain filled the back on accident anyway. And so I was like, all right, well, I'll just strip the neck again and then do the, um, we'll do the body gloss and the face of the headstock. And that's why it turned out like that. Cause I already, it's like you said in the video, I, I kind of know you and you're yeah. playing and i wanted to tailor it my like my main goal as you know as much as to give that guitar as a gift to you was obviously the end goal but from the beginning it was like i need to crush the the, the mirror essentially like i i need to try to make a guitar that i think phil will play more than the mirror not for any reason other than my own edification of knowing you well enough like do i really know you well enough to to knock down your your top guitar it and, is well, it's, you did a great job because it's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, and, um, I mean, it's hard to even talk about sometimes. Oh, it's, my God. You know what I mean? It's just so cool. Yeah. yeah. It was it was a big project. And then, like, I was going to get a different bridge that was black and then try to black out the pickups. But I love the look of the frets versus the shiny pickups versus the shiny bridge. You know, everything kind of goes with each other without overlapping anything. Like, uh, the black burst with the black, uh, with the black tuners. I, I feel like I should be Vanna whiting it right now. Like, <laughs> Just showing like, it. Just look yeah. at that. Yeah. You know why? This is one of those guitars that you, uh, it feel, I feel like cameras don't do it justice. You know it's, what I mean? It's definitely, yeah. And it, the room's kind of dark anyway. Yeah. Like out in the sun, that thing is amazing. Actually, I made three truss rod covers. And I got leopard strap. <laughs> I saw that. Uh, <laughs> I actually showed the video to Dusty Waring after because I was like, oh, your tuners are awesome. Check out this build. And he thought it was cool. <laughs> but I made three truss rod covers. And I say I made three. Jason my Jason Gregory, who did the veneer, taught me how to do it. Right. And I kept one of the truss rod covers to myself. And it's all lopsided because I'd never done it before. And I was using a drum sander and it got all lopsided. And then the two perfect ones I gave to you. And then the other one I gave to Walter, who did the most of the work on the guitar, like stripping and then doing that like, that epic stain process on that, because that thing turned out oh, so incredible. It was hard to it w it was hard to ship to you. I was like, uh, maybe I'll just keep it, but I was like, no, nah, I can't do that. This is this is probably the coolest thing you said is the coolest thing if somebody's ever done for you. This is one of the coolest projects I've ever been able to get rolling. I mean, when you mentioned in the video that that Jean helped out with parts. Like she gave me the pickups and the bridge for free on that thing. And I, all I asked was like, Hey, I know you, you're, I know you're friends with Phil. Like I got this project that I'm working on for him. Like 
I bought everything else, but the pickups on the bridge, even with my employee discount, were still going to be expensive, like crazy expensive. So I was like, if there's any kind of other discount you can give me on these, like just, uh, you know, just, it would be great to have a hand. And then the next day she just showed up with a box and she's like, here you go. And here's the invoice. And I was like, all right, how much do I owe you? She's like, we just promoted them for marketing. So like, that was cool. And that was not really like, you know, a PRS funded, you know what I mean? Right. Like, that was just me saying, Hey, I need a little bit of hand to finish this gift for somebody. It's like all the way done pretty much, except for a couple of things. And she's well, able Jean's to do amazing. That. Yeah. Jean's awesome. Like I say it all the time. And it's true. Uh, I, I, that's why when I work with PRS, I always say that's who I'm working with is Gene. Yeah. I don't talk to any, well, I met Jack a couple of times, but I don't yeah, talk yeah. to anybody at PRS uh, except for Gene. So to me, Gene is PRS to me. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? It's my relationship with, uh, talking to her through emails, through phone calls and, and, and stuff. It's it's why I enjoy the company uh, is her. It's funny. I got that picture with Jack Higginbotham the day after you guys did the podcast. I tried to find him before the podcast so I could be like, hey, you're about to do a podcast with my best friend, Phil. Like, there's a guitar I just finished up for him. Like, just wanted to show you it real quick. And <laughs> the reason why I did that was because if I got a picture with Jack holding the guitar right. and then the video – you know, everybody at the company saw the video. There's no way I'm getting fired for doing stuff that I probably shouldn't have on that guitar, like the weird neck thing. But I probably shouldn't have put the serial number back on because that serial number now refers to a guitar that essentially no longer exists. Because that makes it even cooler. The finish. Again. Yeah, but I was like, ah, if the president of the company like signs off on this guitar, then I'm probably not going to get fired for doing anything. <laughs> so that was like it was a CY, but I also really wanted Jack to to look at that guitar and you know say like, hey, you're empl- like, yeah, I did this, but your employees like. Tons of other people downstairs, like, worked on this uh, to help me, you know, do a gift for my friend. And Jack was really, really supportive of that when, when I showed it to him. And he had nothing but nice things to say about the podcast after, after you guys recorded. So, And Jack is a great guy. He's done a lot to appease my concerns when we came back from COVID. Like, I had a lot of issues. Like, I'm not sure if I want to come back to work in this. And Jack was able to, like... He's, he talked to me specifically about it, and it, it was awesome to be able to get that from him and have the president of the company, you know, the COO of the company, you know, sit you down and say, like, hey, I, I hear you. I hear your issues that you're having. Like, here's what we're doing to make this a safer work environment. So I wanted to give that shout out to Jack real huh. quick while we were on the subject. Well, he's, he's a, every time I've talked to him, he's a great guy. Hey, you got to like a guy who literally starts – sanding guitars yeah and then 30 years later he's a coo of a company yes i mean that's that's the reason why i like him right there yeah because there, there you go um two things one I, a six cycle hum he said it's a pretty guitar that's for sure uh this is a good shout out for ryan uh i i, I very rarely get to watch youtube videos anymore it used to be this thing I used to do all the time, and then because I left it and played when I was working on guitars, but um, and I got to watch a good one. I was talking about grumpy mics earlier, but I watched Ryan's uh, video. I think it was two days ago, so I'm gonna put it in the link just to tell you guys because it's a great video. It was like I, th- Ryan. I'm sorry, I'm not gonna get it right, but I promise the premise will be right. It's like why I don't like or uh, a Rickenbacker guitar. He was talking about that in the chats. He says he's got to borrow one now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, it, great video. I enjoyed the hell out of that video. Um, it, so I just want to do a shout out. Check out obviously six second hum, but also that's a great video. Check that video out. Um, and then uh, so that's one. The second thing is. Um, I thought there was a second thing. I guess not. That's that's the one. Th- oh, that's the first thing. The second thing I was going to tell you was, um, you am I reviewing your Jackson, your new Jackson? Did you bring that? Is that why it's I downstairs? Did. I did. It's downstairs. It's right here. Oh, it's right there. Yeah. Um. So, uh, did you want to show it? Sure. Or yeah, just hey, while he's doing that, I'm going to read a. You get it out, and I'll, I'll uh. I'll read a couple more questions. Uh. Oh, by the way, Jeff did a super chat for no reason. I appreciate that, Jeff. Um, and I know I'm getting there. Uh, Adam said, uh, he says, I've been meaning to do this for a while, but I haven't. And I don't know why, but thanks for your service, Phil. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, that's very kind of you. Uh, uh, yes, I turned wrenches in the army. It was very, you know what? It was a very important part of my life. Like, <laughs> um, but, and I thank you for not only the super chat and for hanging out on the channel, but also for the, the, the compliment. Okay, so Nathan got a new guitar, and he's going to show it to you right I now. Did. New Guitar Day. Uh, I can't go back any farther because of the pedal board. Yeah, anyway. I'm sorry I put the pedal board there. Ugh. That is pink. It is 
It is platinum pink. Yeah, it's, you won't be able to tell over the camera, but it actually has a layer of sparkle on top, like a very, very light pearl coat on top of the pink. So for the cool people that hung out this long in this show, can you tell them what it is? So this guitar is the first guitar that I've ever done full, like a full fret level uh, period. This is the guitar that I essentially did all by myself. I trained on a couple other guitars, but this is the first one I did start to finish, um, you know, all by myself without, the only help was like, hey man, is this done enough? And he's like, oh, just do a little bit more right here. And, you know, and I, I went back and fixed it real quick. Um, I did a little bit of top coat work to this. Mostly uh, the top coat uh, was one of my coworkers. His name's Lalo. Um, he did most of the top coat work. I kind of finished it up and did all the fret work. So this is the first guitar I've ever done a full fret job on. And it went to, uh, I looked up the dealer and it was going to my buddy Nicholas uh, at the Axe Palace. And he's a really good friend of mine. Uh, he came to the PRS factory last year to order some private stocks. I ended up driving him back to the airport. We hang out at NAM and stuff. Um, but I hit him up and I was like, Hey man, you, uh, you got any like custom Jacksons coming through? And he's like, yeah, I actually have like this pink platinum pink one. It's an SL one with a reverse headstock. And, uh, I was like, well, uh, I did the fret work to it and I want to buy it. And so we agreed on a price for it. Um, gave me a little bit of a deal, you know, good friend of mine. And, uh, Phil actually, actually helped me pay for it a little bit. Um, so this guitar, like, this is the second time that Nick got one of the first guitars that I worked on at a new factory because he got one of my PRSs that I worked on when I started at PRS. It was a semi hollow custom 24 in Jade in Jade Charcoal Burst, uh, Wood Library run. And I was really tempted to buy it then, and I didn't. And so this guitar was like, I'm not going to let that happen again. So uh, we worked out a price. It got sent to him. His tech checked it out. Uh, he said my fretwork was good, so I mean that's yeah, it's po that's points for me. Or it's, he didn't say the fretwork was good. He said that his tech always comments on bad fretwork, and his tech didn't comment on any fretwork. Oh, on so this you're, one. so the compliment is that he, he that he didn't have to say anything. Yeah, he didn't yeah. say it sucked. What's interesting, what I found out is one of the new master builders at Jackson. I found out this week. Uh, his name's Pat. He actually uh, used to work with Nicholas's tech in Boston at Guitar Center. Oh, wow. Um, so it's just kind of funny because we were talking about Axe Palace this week, and he's like, oh, yeah, I actually know their tech. Like, I used to work with them at Guitar Center. Uh, so it's just kind of interesting, like, how, how that worked out. So this is a custom shop, uh, custom select uh, SL1, um, JB SSL1 pickups, um, single fret inlay, ebony board, reverse headstock. Show matching. the back so they can see it's neck through, right? Through, yep, neck through. Look at that. Um, matching headstock. Um, truss rod cover delete. So it actually doesn't even have a screw for a truss rod cover. It just straight up doesn't have a truss rod cover. That's the way all guitars should be. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's funny looking around at your guitars. Yeah. Which ones. Well, like, you know, it's uh, Mike, mine, the guitar I did for you still has the truss rod cover, but everything else up there is only like cause your truss rod cover, you made it special. You know, yeah. it's funny. I take all the truss rod covers off. I don't like them on. And, uh, I don't know if I told you this Jean, uh, she made me laugh one day. She sent me this email out of nowhere just like one day just like pops in my email and I and I open it and it's like hey Phil I noticed you're missing some truss rod covers on your PRSs we we can make you some custom she wanted to make me some custom yeah they just started doing that yeah she's Brian's like we'll make you a bunch of awesome custom ones. truss rod covers and send them to you and I said so I responded like an idiot sometimes I don't think at all when I respond right I should respond with hell yeah send me some cool Do custom it. truss yeah. rod covers instead I put Oh, no, they're not missing. I take them off. I don't like truss rod covers because I'm always like, sometimes if I have to adjust the neck, that's one more thing to do. <laughs> so she's like, oh, okay. <laughs> so, uh, I, yeah, I missed out on that opportunity. You know what? I, I, I had this idea, and I was talking because uh, my buddy Jason, who did that truss rod cover and the, and the veneer, he, um, he's not working there anymore. He's building boats now. But I, I had this idea last year. I was like, you should just pay that guy like 70 grand a year and all he does is make truss rod covers out of our old wood you know pick up rings tuner buttons awesome. all that stuff you just and you just buy it off the website and put some crazy markup who cares but it's like you could just have somebody doing that all day because like you just use the drum sander for a little while you know and then he's got to spray them real quick or stain them he's he actually made me a custom uh fret leveling block and he finished it up this week and so that'll be hopefully in my mailbox when i get back to california i'm looking forward to that but uh I thought that would be cool if we just paid a couple people at PRS, like, hey, just make, like, 
these little trim add-ons and you could just buy them through the website. I would do it. It'd be cool. I, I, I mean, looking at how great the truss rod covers turned out for like an hour and a half of work at, you know, after work and I, we made three of them like, yeah, the, I, it was kind of a no brainer, but then you get guitars like this. that don't <laughs> yeah, store yeah. without it. Yeah. I know. I'm like, I don't use them, but that'd be great if you made expensive ones. Exactly. Right. <laughs> like, <laughs> like the tuner buttons. I, I put the, ebony tuner buttons on my Tremonti that actually came on that guitar that you have now. They came on that guitar and I just put them on my Tremonti instead. And then I was like, well, I don't want to take them off my Tremonti. So I got the dusty warning buttons instead. Cause I, I knew you liked the S2 tuners just as much as, uh, you know, yeah, quote unquote I, real phase twos. Yeah. I, I like them both the so. same. Okay. So we got to knock out cause we're, uh, we got to knock out the last ones. It's Mark said, Hey, how about a pristine Fender American Strat deluxe mahogany for 800 bucks? We're in today's current market. That's do a it. deal. Do it. Do it. And no question. A year ago, I'd say, ah, fair, but now do it. I uh, mean, mahogany strats, those never pop yeah, up. Yeah. You never pop Buy up it. the deluxe. It's a, del- I like the deluxe strat. Uh, I like the, the, you know, the little piece of quarter of the neck heel they take off. Uh, that's, uh, it's got the carbon, I think it's carbon fret. Uh, our carbon rod reinforced fretboard, our neck, you know what I mean? Uh, do it. 800 bucks. It's, it's, uh, yeah, for sure. 800 bucks. Look in today's market, I'm not, you know, you know, I've been pretty hard about telling you guys not to pay the crazy prices for used gear right now, but it, I don't see a, any market soon where American deluxe strat and mahogany, which is very rare, isn't going to be worth 800 bucks. And it's a cool guitar. Uh, James says, any tips for undoing sticker damage on nitro finish? That's uh, you. Wax and grease remover is really good for adhesives. And you can buy it in aerosol or you can buy it just as liquid. I prefer the liquid because when I'm wet sanding, I actually like wet sanding with wax and grease remover more than I like sanding with uh, soap and water. But wax, like if you peel the sticker and you get most of it off, you can use goo remover. But wax and grease remover is good on nitro as long as you don't let it sit there. And it dries pretty quickly. What does that mean, don't let it sit there? How long? Like, if you just leave a pool of it on there, like, when I say leave it on there, like, it would have to be a lot because it evaporates really quickly. Um, But if you leave it, like, a big pool sitting on there, like, overnight, it'll mess up the finish. But just as far as just spraying it on your guitar real quick to use it to get it off, yeah, that that should be fine. Um, That's really cool. I didn't know that. Now, okay, there's two more, and this is Austin. Austin says, ask Nate if he wants his Washburn back. That's that weird one when, when oh, you're talking yeah, about the, the weird the, guitar. The, yeah, the weird, that's the, yeah, it's that's the, the weird guitar. So I take it Austin has that guitar now? Yeah, and I didn't tell him I was leaving it with him. I packed it because I was so living just, with You just left it there? I was, leave, I was living with so Austin. Austin. I know Austin. Austin's okay. So Yeah. <laughs> So when I was packing up all my stuff, to, because Austin gave me a place to live last year. Uh, I was living off his, off his couch while we were trying to figure out this interim period of yes. if I'm going to be moving to the West Coast or not. And yes. Austin was awesome and let me live with him for like five months. Uh, and he enjoyed my cooking, which is the most important And thing. he worked on my guitar. Yep. He did the fret work. Yep. And he filled in the tuner holes from the old tuners that yep. are like basically invisible. He, yeah, he it's beautiful. knocked that out Austin, of the Austin, beautiful work. But when I packed up all my stuff, he was at the bar and I left – the guitar because i was like it was going to be a project we had this idea for it and then i was like i gotta go move because i got this job at fender um i just sort of left it at his house and let him discover that i left it there so but he likes projects so we'll see if he ends up doing anything with it yeah now you got something to do yeah (laughs) it's a project i know you work on guitars all day austin but here's another guitar to (laughs) do something with and the last question we have is from john john says i have two usa prs guitars with spots of cloudiness this is the important part is as nathan and i already know where this is going yeah uh so he's got cloudiness in the finish in other words it looks like a little you know yeah yeah it looks like it's turning it looks like clouds outside it says do you have any thoughts about why can anything be done about it that's so let's break that into two it's important why is it happening tell them why it's happening that's tough. Like when I was at PRS, we didn't, I didn't work on a customer guitars that much. And the only time I did is when they were fully refinished already by the time they got to me. Right. So it was, and since we had switched to, um, 2k by that point, uh, we weren't really having that issue anymore. Um, I would definitely call PRS's warranty, which should be Sean or Matt, the customer service and let them know about the guitar and if they don't have any options a refin will be your best option because that's not there's no fix for it you know what i mean and this is the important part uh but why is it cloudy why are the cloudy spots what's what is it that's happening so 
that could be an it could be a few things, but it could be an improper mixture of the way that the finish the, the way that the clear was mixed when it was first sprayed. It could be it could have been improper then, and just over time, it's drying like some nitros and stuff never fully dry. Uh, some other clears can be like that, and over time they start to gas out, or solvents uh, can can start gassing out, and it could be an issue from that. Yeah. So, and it's lifting, isn't it? Lifting off the, it's, that's another problem too. It's like. Sometimes it's lifting. Separate, yeah. Sometimes it's, it's like air in there, right? It yeah. Like separates off the wood. Um, so, okay. So that's the cause. And then the fix, well, I can tell you right now, like you said, they either have to refinish it. Sometimes they can inject super glue in there. Right. And, and that's, that's all really hard to do. Or you can use, uh, um, it's not thinner. It's like a retarder is what they call it. And it'll kind of reactivate some of the finish underneath and let it let it start drying again. You know what I mean? Like, so that's something that you can do. So there you go. All right. That was the last question. I want to first, I know last thing I'm not old. I'm vintage said, I really enjoyed today's podcast. Enjoyed the conversation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, for, man. I appreciate yeah, that. I appreciate that too. I want to definitely thank Nathan for coming and hanging out. This is something we've been planning, uh, you know, to, to do for a while. But you know, it's been. And now that I'm back in California, like I can probably come back. Yeah. Every once in a while, we'll see. I'm trying to get. Uh, I'm gonna try to get Fender to see if they'll pay for one of the paint huffer classes because I really want to start going to those. Every yeah. time they post videos and live streams. Yeah, those the paint, paint hover classes. classes are cool. If you guys don't know about them, definitely go on Paint Huffer's Instagram and check that out. They did a pinstriping masterclass yep. the other day, and I was like, oh, it's, I was it's amazing stuff. And then, um, so on that note, we're gonna let you go. I just want to thank. Uh, first of all, I want to thank. What do I want to thank? which is great. Three string bass. <laughs> this will make sense one day. <laughs> Anyways, uh, I thank you for everyone hanging out to the end, especially this long show. And of course, thanks Nathan. And, uh, I guess until next week, thank you for your time and know, know your, your gear. gear. Yeah. You gotta say it. Cause <laughs> like a choir or something. Yeah. You gotta say it. Cause okay. Bye. Doesn't sound right. <laughs> okay. See ya. Okay. Bye. All right. Bye guys.